friends we have been discussing office orthopedic topics which form the main bulk of our day to day practice up till now we had a great insight in management of various conditions we come across in opd today we have another set of interesting topics and interesting panel to discuss the issue <clears throat> i welcome dr pradeep choudhary dr kiran shete dr arup mukherji dr neeraj bislani dr ashok godke dr sanju bhandari and dr p n vasudevan as our guest faculty today we have variety of topics it will be interesting to learn etiquettes of powerpoint presentation and use of digital media in orthopedic we are also going to see management of low back colis fracture periarticular injections hand splint and use of dmrd in rheumatoid arthritis all of the faculty is experienced towards from the field and need no further introduction so without wasting further time we will start the program i congratulate and appreciate the effort of convener dr narayan karne and moderator dr ashok ghodke and our coordinator dr ashish bhadnis and abhijit kale thanks team ortho tv dr ashok sham and dr neeraj bislani for their support thank you everyone for your patience and really. over to neeraj thank you sir uh, with this uh, we'll take this in parts the first part will be on digital so i invite dr pradeep choudhary to kindly share his screen and uh, start his talk on powerpoint presentation okay uh, so uh, good evening everyone uh, we are all uh, seeing the my screen is okay yeah okay so we'll just go for what are do's and don'ts or in other words what are the etiquettes of the powerpoint presentation or what are the slides and that will help you avoid the pitfall of the bad slides why a good presentation is needed because it is very important in every presentation who says what says and how says who and what is you you can control but your presentation is how you say in your presentation that is very important how what impact you are going to give in your presentation that we we'll are going to discuss is that what tips to be covered the outline the slide structure fonts color background animations graphs spelling and grammar short form and abbreviation number name and date in conclusion this is the outline of the today's talk what we are going to discuss make your first or second slide on outline of your presentation for example the previous slide i have given the description what i am going to talk about this presentation why you want to do this because you may be unknown to the audience topic may be unfamiliar title gave little clue about the content it's an abstract index or back cover of the book so it's it is you should give an outline of the talk in a first or second slide that is very important only place main point in the outline slide you always you don't have to put the little uh, the final details in your first or second slide in outline slide. only put main points and follow the order of your outline for the rest of presentation that is very important use one to two slide per minute of your presentation write in point form not in complete sentence include four to five points per slide avoid wordiness use keywords and phrases only that are these are the basic thumb rule of the powerpoint presentation now see this is a bad slide too too much written the audience will not going to read all this thing so what is this good slide show one point at a time that will will help audience concentrate what you want to say will prevent audience from reading ahead will help you to keep your presentation focused use at least 18 point is point font is on the slide is minimum use different size font for main point 
and a secondary point which I use in previous slide. Like this, this point is 24 point, the main point font is 28 point, and the title font is 36 point. So use different size font for main point and secondary point. Minimum font should be at least 18. Use a standard font like Times New Roman or Arial. Don't use, uh, like this is a very bad slide, it's so small font. The audience will not be able to read it. Capitalize only when necessary. It is difficult to read and it amounts that you're shouting. So don't capitalize only and capitalize only when it is necessary. Don't use a complicated form which is written here. Use a color of font that contrasts sharply with the background. Nowadays, it is black and white is considered to be with the LED screen is the best, best is there. Use color to reinforce the logic of your structure. Light blue title and dark blue text, there is example is there. Use color to emphasize a point, but only use color font occasionally. Using a bad, like this is a bad color font, the Dundas contrast is the background color is hard to read. This is a bad color font. Using color for decoration is distracting and annoying. Don't use that. Using a different color for each point is unnecessary. Using a different color for secondary point is also unnecessary. Trying to be creative. But it's also bad. Don't be so creative with color fonts. Background. Use background such as this, this one that are attractive but simple. Use background which are light. Use the same background consistently throughout the presentation. Now I have used some bad. Now this is a bad background that are distracting and difficult to read. This is a, again background with the animation coming. This is bad. This is again a bad background. Do not change background whimsically or aberrantly in your presentation. This is again, always be consistent background that you use. Don't use sharp, attracting or color which are uh, bad to the eyes. Don't use those colors. Animation is used intelligently, then it is good. Otherwise animation is used for, it is used for transition of the slide, for appearance and disturbance of the line, paragraph or an image. It can be used. Like now these are all bad animation. These are all, these are all Distracting animation. You should not use those type of animation. These are not, they're all, I'm giving you an example of bad. These are all bad animation. Do not use distracting animation. Do not use irrelevant animation. Yeah, these are all, these are all distraction. They are, should not be used like this. Do not go overboard animation. Like every slide, somebody is having 10 animation. These are all bad things. These are all, you see, bad. These are all bad animation. Animation irrelevant to the topic. This is again nothing to do with that. They are used only for decoration. Use aberrantly, no bad slide. Animation irrelevant to the topic. Structure, like this is again a bad animation. People are using this. This is also bad. Do not use animation for transition in slide for teaching purposes. Animations cause interruption, distraction, diversion, disruption, disturbances from the theme of the importance. Good animation is be consistent animation that you use. Use animation to make a point clear and easy to understand. Like suppose if you're ophthalmologist, you can use animation for conversions and for diverging. Video clip in the form animation use it is whenever required to emphasize a point of interest. That's why you use video, otherwise you don't require. Use graph rather than charts in Word. Like somebody uses and graphs easier to comprehend and retain them in Word. Trained are easy, easier to visualize in graph form. The charts and words are better is the graph you use. Always title your graph. Like this is a graph, it's a bad. Nothing is given, no title is given. You can't comprehend what the uh, uh, speaker wanted to tell you. So this is a major surgery done in first quarter 2011. So that will give you, this is a good graph. This is a bad graph. No title is given. Now I'll, so I'll just discuss. Now see, one is good, other is a bad one. Now, what is good is title is missing. This is bad. Title is missing. Minor grid lines are unnecessary. Fonts are too small. Colors are illogical and shades are distracting. So this is a bad graph and that was a good graph. Title is there. No minor grid line. Fonts are readable. Colors are harmonious and no distracting shading. So this is a, these are a good and bad graph. Illustration of picture is worth a thousand words. It helps in understanding. So picture should be given. But they should be, it's relevant and it should be remembering. It should not, there should not be irrelevant picture should be there. This is again a picture which giving you a wound is there and repair. So the illustrations are, these are good. 
abbreviation and short form should not be used in any presentation like lp is stand for so many things what you are talking about nobody knows so short form should not be used without them using in first full form in prior sentences that is a must short form may not be known by audience of mixed faculties short form and abbreviation are used as empirical basis not having any standard method so better to avoid them as much as possible avoid sms or whatsapp language in your presentation use bullets for emphasizing there are people use empirically bullets number so bullets for emphasizing different points numbers are used when you enumerating something like causes branches factor diseases procedure then you should use the number use simple and non attractive bullets shite should not be more than 70% of the font of that particular bullet proof your slides for spelling mistake the use of repetitive word grammatical error you might have made so these are all uh, give a bad impression on the audience if you are not spellings are wrong or words are repeated sometimes and if you are not having good command in the language please have someone else check your presentation or when you are in a short form presentation the always the red line is there so always right click and then check what alternative uh, alternative spelling is there insert number name and date it helps in sorting and arranging slides give clue regarding progress during presentation like name of the writer institution give recognition so always put that date also assist to keeping records so slides should have a number maybe have a date and may have some sort of a uh, like this when you go for a conclusion a complex complicated convoluted with full of data and repetition of ideas invite loss of attention and boredom so conclusion should not be like that a difficult hard to understand presentation is not a key for a winner presentation is for easy simple straight forward and uncomplicated conversing with the audience it should be made to convey message of an article or research work in grateful effortless and easy to understand form use an effective and strong closing use a conclusion slide to summarize the main point of presentation suggest future avenues of research and at the end when audience grasp some idea they will always rem also remember you so it is always like that conclusion should be strong it should not be complicated one at end of the presentation a simple question slide invite audience to ask question provide a visual aid during question period avoid ending the presentation abruptly any suggestion to improvise the presentation any question like this should be asked in the question like this is never end your presentation with a thank you this is this is a very bad uh, thank you slide you should end your slide even if you want to put a thank you put on the last slide which is having a, a summarize because audience will be when the question answer there audience will be seeing this slide so this doesn't look like nice thank you very much for your patient hearing here i am done yeah thank you pradeep for the crisp presentation uh, i have one or two comments about your presentation so you it was very good that you should uh, not use animation just because for the heck of it that was a very good take home message yeah. second was most important is that whenever i am doing a presentation or dr pradeep is doing a presentation you will not see a thank you slide even so we never put thank you slide you can of course orally say thank you yeah. but the last slide which remains the see most of the two slides which remain maximum in your presentation if you have been especially in a big conference you have been given only 5 minutes 7 minutes or 10 minutes it will remain on the slide is the first slide and the last slide they will remain for the maximum number of time because when you are starting up that may be just put up by the audio visual guy and when you are ending you are waiting for the questions to come up so your last slide should be there so your last slide can be a take home message or can be a case or a question as he put it up and the first slide also should be something similar that people should get interested it should not be a title slide that basically it's a title and that is why it's like something like that. something like a suppose if you are speaking on say spondylolisthesis or if you are speaking on an injection technique so maybe you can put it up a case of or an mri picture that basically this is the uh, this is the slide now tell me what you want me to do of it something like that it is very important or you can put a like suppose you are treating any fracture so algorithm can be there your last slide like what 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 the management plan or flow chart and then if you want to say thank you then put thank you on that particular slide only otherwise no need for last slide to give a thank yes. you i want to just say one thing 
uh, actually this powerpoint presentation uh, good uh, tips were given by dr anand thakur long back and uh, i still remember he said you said nine uh, times new roman or arial but he said times new roman should not be used because it has some small things like this you should always use arial or even people use comic sans uh, that can be okay but uh, usually don't use times new roman was the message which was given uh, by him as i remember i am now never using i am always using arial that is always the best uh, thing the message yes. is that you should not use complicated uh, uh, fonts that is the issue times roman Don't nowadays think... uh, nowadays dr bandari the fonts are so many nowadays earlier it was 10 20 now you are having if you are having a uh, apple then different font other many fonts are there so which is simple and attractive and readable that is the key thing two more points you said very nicely that the font should be between say something like uh, actually uh, not 18 i usually think between 20 to 36 only some people use uh, like 50 uh, 44 or something wo ampa hai jaise lagta hai you don't feel that my point is that 18 you. is the 18 is the minimum and then you can 36 24 and 28 for title and 24 yeah. for that uh, thing agree uh, is really a good thing and again contrast the contrast yeah. if it all your side is busy then it should not be less than 18 if your side is a busy one then should not be less than 18 That you is the point. Think that some of the members of the audience are a bit visually uh, not <laughs> that strong. And yeah, I agree. 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 Very small agree. fonts, thirteen, fourteen lines on a slide, all bad contrast. Then people just give up. They just don't you know give yes. any attention yes. at all. Yes, yes. This one more thing we should do, we should follow definitely. These are the common mistakes. That's why I'm insisting that you have said it nicely. These are the common Thank mistakes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. uh is if there are no more questions i will start my presentation yeah can you see my screen just let me yes. know if you can see my screen yes we can see we can see yeah so most of us take pictures like my topic is on use of digital media and orthopedics so most of us took pictures of mris which is very common now patient comes to me with nowadays uh, sometimes one sometimes two mris most of the patients come to me with an mri they have not taken an mri they ask me ki mera mri kyun nahi kar rahe so this is a very common a uh, picture which i will take from my iphone and uh, this is how it looks though i can make a diagnosis but there are two three issues one is that you can see the patient's name you can see the diagnostic center's name you can see some white background and the image is generally bluish so what i'm going to talk about today is clinical photo editing using an iphone though you can use the same features on an android also but because i use more of an iphone i'm going to talk mainly on iphone and the topics which i'm going to cover are the mainly mris or editing the clinical picture editing and making collages so this is the image which i showed normally it comes like this in a camera it looks very bluish and the identity is there so what do i do to edit it so you in now in iphone you don't need much you just need the iphone photos app or the google photos app where you can do a lot of editing simple editing so this is a small video where you can see i'm showing that this is the photo which i had taken it has come bluish and it has come from far now i want to edit this photo so i just click on edit on the right hand top side of the iphone screen and then i get lot of option then i get a option where i can straighten the photo if it has come diagonally or i can crop it this is how i am cropping it and once i am satisfied with the crop i will just make it very small and i will see to it that try to exclude the patient's diagnostic center's name and the patient's name out of it if it has come diagonal i can make it straighten and then after that there is a option called filters so at the bottom the filters will appear and i would select mono there are other three black and white filters which is silver tone and the noir but i think for this image mono works for some x rays the silver tone work may better and then i would just save it and i will click on done of course you can always change the brightness make it a little better so it looks better there is brightness saturation uh brilliance there are so many other options which you can do depending on how much time you can dedicate to it but some basic editing is required 
where you need to remove the patient's identity and make it look so that the diagnosis becomes very clear. Saw the difference how it was blue and now it has become so clear, black and white, like a normal how it's supposed to be. And this is the final image and you just save it. However, the disadvantages in the iPhone is that whenever you are trying to edit an image, always try to make a copy because if you have edited other image, the original goes away. So always try to make a copy of it and then try to save it. This is how it looks brilliant. The patient's name is gone. Only the date is remaining. That is what we need. And uh, the diagnosis, we can see that it's a classical medial meniscal tear. Now we talk about the patient's identity. In 2020, 2021, it was very easy to actually hide the patient's identity because most of us, use, most of them used to come in masks. So the, though this patient is in mask, you can still make out that who he is. So how do we hide the identity of the patient using the simple editor on the iPhone? So again, on the top right, in the photos app, there is an edit option. I click on that. And after I click on that, I get these options in the bottom where I can actually do some drawings. But for this, you will need an external app most of the times. But if you're using a Galaxy Note where there is a S Pen or the Samsung phone where you still have a good gallery app, they have these features inbuilt. So I would like to edit these images a little bit. And after that, once I've done a little bit of editing and making it straight and making it brighter, I would want it to go in an external app where I would want to draw on it. So I would use this external app. These are the external options available for me and call something called as markup. So when I click on markup here, I get these options of drawing. As you can see, I get these multiple pens and I'll just select one of the pens and with a black color, preferably or a red color, I would want to hide whatever is identifying the patient. So here there are two things which identify the patient. One is the belt of the patient and one is the face of the patient. So I'll just draw <coughs> with a fat pen and it will get hide, hidden. And same thing I will draw on the belt also and it will get hidden. If you want, you can use an external app where you can insert a shape or the Galaxy Note phones allow you to directly insert a shape in it. So this is how the photo comes and the identity is hidden. So mainly for clinical picture, you need to hide the identity. Then I come to something called as making a photo collage. Sometimes we don't need to send separate photographs. It becomes too much to send on WhatsApp. So it is always easy to make a photo collage of one or two photos and send it. So it's for a better explanation. For that, I use an app called Photo Grid. It is a third party app available on Android and iPhone both. This is how it looks. So I open Photo Grid and I select this first option called Grid. And after I've selected, it allows me to tell me to select photos. So I can select one or two photos here. And I have to select a grid. So maybe I will select this one or this one. So two photos side by side. I can, of course, add a photo from here. Then I click on this photo. And then I click select one photograph of the MRI. And select another photograph of the same patient of the MRI. And that is, I can just put an arrow on it if I want. By doing using the markup. And I can adjust these photos so that it looks like a very classical. I can, of course, write a text on it. I can even write uh, drawing, do drawings on it. And I can even uh, put my uh, name on it so that the, if anybody wants to copy, my name will go with it. Though it is a paid app, but it allows you to do many things for free. So don't pay for it. Use mainly with free, but you get that photo grid thing on the bottom. That's the only disadvantage of the free app. But that works for most of the time. Then I come to the next feature which is called the combined photo and video collage. This is very useful if you're using a lot of Instagram nowadays. You can make an Instagram reel, you can make an Instagram story out of your simple photographs by using this app. So again, I select a grid here. And this time I will select a grid of four things, which will be one, two, three, four. So I will select, there are so many photographs. Recent, uh, last year I had a chance of visiting uh, Sancheti Hospital, when they have, where they have installed the OAM and uh, Dr. Shailesh Adgaonga demonstrated the uh, surgery in OAM using OAM. So I'll select these four photographs and a video. I will keep on selecting. So I select up to four and it automatically gives me options. So I'll select these are these are not the good options. So I'll select a plain option, which are the first one. See, these are all there are always designs, but I will select this first one because I want to make it look we are using it for professional purposes. And then each and photo and video, I can use it and mark it up. I can remove the sound if I don't want the sound. <coughs> I can keep the sound of one video. So this is the OAM navigation system. 
and then I have adjusted the video so that it looks, it appears that we are looking at this as Dr. Shailesh is explaining it to me. And these are the photos. One is with Parag Sancheti and one is with Dr. Shailesh. We are behind is the OA. So this appears very good when you are sending it as a video. You can put this up on your Instagram stories or your reels and it appears really good. And this is how you can make a combined photo and video collage. And you can remove the sound. You can put your own music, put your own sound. That is up to you. So with the simple free app photo grid, you can just export this as a video. And once the export is finished, this is how your video looks. And you can see that uh, how this looks very classy that though I'm looking at the screen and the screen is on the left side. So you can make small, some nice uh, videos of these small, small things for your own self. And also you can make a combined video. So uh, from my side, this is it. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Ashok Gorke. And if there are any questions from the house, I'm ready to take them. Excellent presentation, uh, Neeraj. I, I, I would, I would ask, I would like to ask you uh, this today's presentation. Uh, you, you, you prepared it uh, before, or you are just showing it on the screen? No, no, it is, it is not live. It has been prepared long back. In fact, it was prepared last year uh, because that is the time when I visited Sancheti Hospital. So it is, uh, it is. Uh, but what I do is that I use my iPhone. Even in Android, it is possible. You, I use the screen recording feature and with the screen recording feature, I record the whole editing feature, editing part, and I then uh, put it on my uh, keynote in my Mac. I can also put it in the PowerPoint, the same video. So it gives me an end result is a video of the whole procedure, which I did like the editing of the photo grid and everything. And then I can just save it as a video and then I put it in my presentation. So this is a proper presentation. I have not shown my phone. I have not connected my phone. So it was looking as if you are if you were you are editing it right now uh, during your presentation. That is how it's going to that yeah that is the whole that was my whole purpose because somebody who's trying to do it should be able to follow the step by step instructions. Okay. Thank you very much, Ashok. So if you're saying like this, my purpose is solved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if there are no other questions, I would. Uh, I'd invite Dr. Sanjeev Bhandari. He will he will talk on periarticular injections for routine orthopedic problems. Bhandari, sir, please. Yeah, one sec. Dr. Pradeep has a question. Pradeep, you are muted. Uh, Neeraj, uh, I might leave in between because of some other commitment. Uh, no if uh, uh, Dr. Ashok will allow me. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Ashok and uh, Neeraj and all other faculty members. Uh, my topic is about the periarticular injection techniques, which I am using extensively for last uh, nearly 35, 40 years. And one second, I'll just put this view thing. Yeah. So. Uh, over the last 35, 40 years, I have really, uh, I know I can say confidently that more than 90% of common orthopedic problems can be defect effectively managed non-surgically. But when I was a PG teacher for the last 15, 20 years, I have noticed that uh, students are extensively interested in only learning the surgeries, the surgical skills and the techniques. But when you want to teach them some conservative uh, means, they are not that enthusiastic. And so I really thank uh, Dr. Narayan Karne and other their team who have taken keen interest in this office orthopedics thing, where, which is the art and science of non-surgical management of these common day-to-day -day orthopedic problems, which can help the patients a lot. And in this non-surgical management, injections play an important and vital role. These injections can be diagnostic, as you all know, subacromial injections or diagnostic root blocks, etc., where we just inject the local anesthetic to ascertain the source of pain. But majority of the times, I use these injections as therapeutic injections, where there's a mix of local anesthetic with a corticosteroid preparation, either triamcinolone acetonide or methylprednisolone acetate. 
Actually, to begin with, we were using the hydrocortisone acetate, which was marketed by Russell. It used to come in the two ml ampules, but it faded away from the market. And so now I have shifted mainly to methyl penicillin, which is my preference. And otherwise, sometimes the Kenacort or the Triamcinolone. I'll not go into the details of how a corticosteroid helps in the inflammatory conditions. The only thing is that it reduces the inflammation and vascular uh, congestion. And as it is, uh, these areas are relatively avascular, no systemic absorption and side effects are seen. Now, I'll be coming to injection techniques for common orthopedic problems. And as I said, I have used it in more than 40 to 50,000 patients, and I'm very happy about these. Maximum number of injections I have done for knee problems, then 20 to 25% for shoulder, and remaining 15 to 20 for other conditions like fibromyalgia, plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, chronic sprains and facet injections, et cetera, et cetera. That the broad categories of these therapeutic injections are mainly periarticular injections about which I'm going to talk today. Then very rarely intraarticular injections like the first carpometacarpal joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the temporomandibular joint, et cetera. And Last is the local connective tissue injections like fibromyositis, plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, etc. So I will be talking mainly on the periarticular injections, which forms the bulk of my injection techniques. Now my usual regimen is like the course of one to three injections, depending on the location and severity. The frequency is usually I like to inject at weekly interval, uh, two or three injections for major joints like shoulder or knee joint and only one injection for many other small, smaller joints. The maximum interval can be sometimes up to three weeks if there's an outstation out patient and they cannot come uh, really weekly. Of course, in addition to these injection techniques, supplementary treatment in the form of NSAIDs and physiotherapy plus mobilization as well as training exercises are advised. And this is my hospital file on which mainly the three degenerative conditions which we treat with, like uh, osteoarthritis of the knee, the lumbar spondylosis and cervical spondylosis. For that, what you have to take care of and how to do the exercises is uh, illustrated so that the patient can follow it nicely. Of course, the possible complications, first which I have used, uh, noticed in the beginning is the stretch pains. We are giving these injections in fibrous tissues. And so to begin with for about 12 to 24 hours, Patient, uh, patients can get stretch pains and for that I usually mix this uh, steroid with a local anesthetic and also give an injectable analgesic along with it like a diclofenac injection or a uh, tramadol, that is, uh, uh, tramadol injection and also a short anesthetic course till they have some pain. Second important thing is infection, especially in diabetics. And as I have noticed in uh, frozen shoulder or the adhesive capsulitis, many patients don't know that they are diabetic. But once you do their blood sugar levels, you find that they are diabetics. And in these situations, if their blood uh, sugar level is high, you wait for the control of diabetes. And if it is, say, somewhat higher up, then you can use an IV antibiotic and give the injection. Also, for all injections, strict aseptic precautions uh, are the essential. And always it is better to give in a minor operation theater or a sterile procedure room and not in your OPD setup itself. Now coming to the periarticular injections, most common indication for me uh, is uh, around the knee joint. And in the periarticular injections around the knee joint, uh, I have used these uh, injections mainly for osteoarthritis of the knee, grade one to three. Also some chronic sprains, like usually grade one or maximum grade two sprains, like medial collateral ligament, uh, chronic sprains, or posterior medial capsular ligamentous sprains, these injections work very nicely. Of course, sometimes even for osteoarthritis grade four or five, when the patient is either unwilling or not affording for a total joint replacement, I may have, I use these pediatrical injections and they get good relief, but it may not be long lasting. Now, this is a case of grade two medial compartmental patellofemoral osteoarthritis. You can see that there are small uh, marginal osteophytes which are coming from the medial femoral as well as medial uh, tibial condyles. And in the lateral X-ray, you can see that there's a small uh, osteophyte which is coming from the superior pole of patella. Now these osteophytes usually in certain situations, 
uh, after certain strenuous activity or some uh, strenuous function at their home, etc., the patients can get exacerbations of this osteoarthritis. And there is periarticular inflammation at these two specific spots, which I have noticed over the years. And these are the main tender spots, which I most of the times this will be present in the osteoarthritis knee patients. One is along the medial joint line near the junction of the uh, superior, uh, lower inferior pole of patella and the middle femoral con uh, condyle. And second is at the superior lateral pole of patella. In osteoarthritis of knee, there is always tenderness along the medial joint line. At the junction of the medial pole of patella and the medial joint line. And the patient is having pain here, you can see that. And the second tender spot is solution. Second tender spot is at the superior lateral corner of patella of See the patient missing when I am pressing there. These are the two common spots where I will be ejecting. So Many people like to give intraarticular injections, but I have never given intraarticular injections in the knee joint, and I will always give periarticular injection. I will go down there at the first spot, hit the uh, bone about one to two millimeter above the joint line, and then uh, in infiltrate about one ml of methylprednisolone along with uh, 1.5 ml of xylocaine, and the remaining. Uh, 1 ml plus 1.5 ml of xylocaine will be injected at the superior lateral pole area, which I showed in the beginning. Here also, I'll hit, and in the flex position, the suprapatellar pouch and the, uh, is uh, obliterated, and so there's no chance of going intraarticular. Another patient having the same uh, thing about grade 3 osteoarthritis. These are the two spots which are being injected. Many patients have bilateral osteoarthritis and you can inject both the knees at the same sitting. This is the right knee which is being injected and this is the left knee which is being injected. All these patients, after first injection, they will get about between somewhere between 30% to 60% pain relief. And after second uh, injection, usually more than 75% pain relief is there. And in grade one to three osteoarthritis, if they follow the instructions properly after the, your injections, these uh, pain relief lasts even for years, which is my experience. If they really go on doing the exercises properly, and uh, if they really don't uh, squat too much or don't uh, climb the stairs too much, then they can have good relief for months together or years together. In some osteoarthritis cases, I have, especially when there's marked genuverum, I have found that there's a tenderness uh, at the distal attachment of the superficial part of the middle collateral ligament. And I usually inject at that spot. As you can see here, the, in the, here, I'm injecting at the, I have marked it here, and I'm injecting at that spot on the, and then second spot is at the superior lateral corner. Another case where they genuvarum and uh, I'm injecting at the distal medial uh, collateral ligament and another at the medial joint line. This lady did not have much patellofemoral osteoarthritis or pain. So at these two spots, it was injected. As I said, very good relief with two to three injections is there. And then other supplementary treatment, if the patient does it nicely with uh, physiotherapy, lifestyle changes and weight reduction, uh, cortisception, hamstring exercises and in and in some of the cases, last four or five years, I'm giving intraarticular hyaluronic acid injections in selected grade two to three osteoarthritis cases, uh, along with the second or third periarticular injection. And then I have seen that nearly two to three years, the patient is pain free. So these intraarticular hyaluronic acid injections as a supplement, not with the first injection, because it has been noted, and I have attended certain conferences. They have said that if you give the, the only the intraarticular hyaluronic injection. With, after the first injection, the patient gets, uh, for about two to three days or five days, the patient can get uh, increase in pain. So I usually give it with the second or third uh, periarticular injection, and usually the patients don't experience any increase in pain of their osteoarthritis. Other indications for periarticular injections on the knee, as I said, chronic painful grade one or two sprains with no obvious instability. This is very important, no obvious instability. Usually you will get uh, patients have, having medial collateral ligament sprain with localized tenderness at the proximal attachment or 
uh, of the MCL at adductor tubercle. And you can inject it there. And second is chronic posterior medial corner capsular ligament strains. And the patient points directly at that spot. And only one injection usually suffices. With that, the patient gets very good relief. Who is suffering for nearly six months or one year, he can get very good relief. So this is a uh, case where there was chronic painful grade one medial collateral ligament sprain. Varus valgus XI, you can see that there's not much opening up at all. This was the spot about uh, uh, two to three centimeters uh, proximal to the medial collateral end at the adductor tubercle. And here I have injected one uh, ml of uh, methylprednisolone along with uh, one to two ml of xylocaine. And usually the patient gets very good relief. And it is probably one injection will suffice uh, and will give permanent relief. Similarly, this is chronic posterior medial uh, corner sprain, grade one, not much instability. And you can inject it there and the patient will get very good relief. He, many people come to me after consulting two or three or many orthopedic uh, surgeons and they have advised uh, them exercises and all those drugs. But with this one injection, they will get very good relief. Another patient with a similar posterior medial corner relief and he is being injected. Now, second most common set after the knee is the shoulder. Most common thing which we encounter in the OPD is the periarthritis shoulder. And the next stage is the adhesive capsulitis, which you commonly refer to as frozen shoulder. Then subacromial bursitis or rotator cuff tendinitis, acromial clavicular joint arthritis, and bicipital tendinitis. Now, coming to the periarthritis shoulder or adhesive capsulitis, frozen shoulder. The painful and restricted movements are three. That is, the, how they, all of us know, abduction, external rotation, and taking hand behind the back. Now, uh, the most painful and tender spot in all these conditions I have always found is that the anterior capsular ligament is complex. This is the spot where the maximum tenderness is there. Uh, ask the patient to take hand behind the back as much as he can or she can. Because in frozen shoulder, this movement is restricted and severely painful in many conditions and inject at the most prominent point anteriorly, which is always most tender. So this is the injection which I am doing uh, at the anterior capsule ligamentous complex. I have found very common association uh, of uh, the, as we call the triad of frozen shoulder with cervical spondylosis, uh, with fibromyalgia and diabetes mellitus. So fibromyalgia is, is isolated uh, I, uh, along with the cervical spondylosis, and it is usually associated with frozen shoulders. So th this is the uh, spot. Uh, I ask the patient to take the uh, hand on the uh, behind, uh, beyond the opposite knee, so that the shoulder blade of the scapula is stretched. The medial uh, border of the uh, scapula is palpated, and then if you go down along the lower border of trapezius medial to it. You can find about one inch below that a very painful tender spot, and that is the usual spot of fibromyalgia where you can inject. So this is a patient with severely painful right frozen shoulder. The abduction was hardly forty degrees, and along with that, she had cervical spondylosis with fibromyalgia and diabetes mellitus. And see, after seven days, abduction was hardly forty degrees with uh, before first injection. In these conditions where of frozen shoulder. Uh, I used to do a manipulation under general anesthesia about 10, 15 years back. But over the last 10, 15 years back, hardly one or two out of 100 patients require manipulation. Otherwise, all of these patients are usually uh, get full range of movement and pain relief with the uh, three uh, periarticular injections given at weekly interval and associated with physiotherapy and mobilization exercises. And after two weeks, you can see the patient is smiling with full range of movement. Of course, the abduction may take about one to one and a half months to come, but the pain will be relieved within eight to 15 days. See, this is second severely painful left frozen shoulder. She was diabetic and she was suffering for nearly four months. She was not allowing me to touch her hand also. It was so severely painful. And after 10 days, you can see the smiling patient with nearly uh, good, uh, near full good range of movement. Sometimes there is adhesive capsulitis with rotator tendinitis or even tear. Here I will inject anteriorly as well as one ml I will inject in the subacromial uh, space. This was the patient, this is his MRI report, which says that there is full thickness tear of the rotator cuff involving the supraspinatus and anterior aspect of the infraspinatus tendon. He was having severe pain and not able to uh, actively as well as passively abduct the arm. 
two days after the second periodical of the injection, he was coming daily for physiotherapy and he had active full range of movement and also uh, ab abduction as well as other range movements were totally improved. This is another patient with partial uh, supraspinatus tear. He came from uh, a place about 100, 150 kilometers away. And after eight days before second uh, periarticular uh, injection, he had nearly 60 to 70 percent relief. And at the end of three injections, he was totally normal. Now, this is the old lady. She had full thickness tear left side. Her MRI gives this uh, report that there is a full thickness tear with actually uh, there is a detraction of the proximal tendon. And there was no active abduction and uh, even passive abduction was painful. I told her that actually you have to undergo uh, this rotator cuff repair, but that lady was not ready. And so I injected her anteriorly as well as the subacromial space. And after three weeks, you can even see that uh, her pain has gone. Mainly she was very happy because her pain had gone. Though there's some drop of the hand, but she could now actively lift it up and uh, the pain had gone. Other shoulder problem which you commonly encounter is subacromial uh, bursitis in young patients, especially overhead sports like uh, basketball, volleyball, etc., or badminton. These patients can develop uh, subacromial bursitis and uh, severe pain. And uh, here, you this is the spot where you can inject. Even here, I ask the patient to take the hand behind so that the subacromial space becomes more uh, prominent. And then I will inject uh, 3 ml of dilocate with 2 ml of uh, methyl and they usually one or two injections, the patient gets full relief. Other sites for periarticular injections are chronic wrist sprains. Many times patients come with chronic ulnar collateral ligament sprains. They have typical tenderness there and the supination pronation is uh, at terminally severely painful. And another is the dorsal wrist sprains. Now, this is the chronic wrist pain due to uh, uh, ulnar collateral ligament sprain. And this is uh, another case with a dorsal sprain where I am injecting in the dorsal uh, ligament. In malunited distal end radius fractures, many patients come to you, in, especially from the rural area from the, where they have uh, distal end radius fracture, either untreated or improperly treated. And they come with malunited uh, fractures. And if you'll see, there's no tenderness on the distant radius, but the tenderness is because of the DRUJ uh, sprain and also the, sometimes with ulnar collateral ligament sprain. And if you'll inject at both these spots, uh, half ml here and half ml there, you can get very good relief. Similarly, chronic lateral ankle sprain, tenderness is at the anterior uh, or the distal attachment of the anterior talofibular ligament. And if you'll inject there, the patients along with uh, ankle support for about one to one and a half months, they will have very good relief. In addition, there are many other common orthopedic problems which don't come under periarticular things as such. As I said, fibromyalgia, tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, plantar fasciitis, chronic coccidinia, trigger finger, etc. And in spine, facet, facetal joint arthritis with facetal pains, uh, where you give facetal injections. These all are things that are amenable to uh, these uh, local injection techniques. Now, is the relief temporary? I'll say both yes and no. In certain degenerative conditions like new osteoarthritis or uh, say facetal arthritis, if you will inject, they will get relief, but they have to follow the lifestyle changes and exercises. Otherwise, the pain can recur. While in certain conditions like plantar fasciitis or even uh, frozen shoulder, once the patient is relieved, I have never seen them recurring in the same shoulder. They may have pain in the opposite shoulder, but not in the same shoulder again. They should be, of course, avoided in insertional tendinitis, like at the uh, insertion of tendoachillis, because there are chances of tendoachillis rupture. And nowadays, I am finding good relief with PRP injections at this size. Also, decal one stenosynoitis, because it may give temporary relief, but you will have to under, the patient will have to undergo surgery for getting permanent relief. And of course, in uncontrolled diabetics, where the uh, first do the proper diabetic control before giving injection, uh, use uh, strict asepsis and even inject one IV antibiotic shot so that they will not uh, develop infection there. So friends, injections is a win-win situation both for the patient as well as the treating surgeon. 
for me it has been most rewarding because they are innumerable as i said 40 to 50000 patients i have uh, treated so innumerable happy patients this is the most important thing for me one satisfied patient always brings many many more they always the patient says amcha gawa bade in our uh, village there are so many people who are suffering from knee pains will bring them and they really bring so many patients to you i have got lots and lots of patients from far away places even one patient was brought from jodhpur uh, about uh, 1500 2000 kilometers away and many other patients who come to me from about 400 500 kilometers away for this injections because their relatives and friends tell me them that you go to him and you will get good relief uh, this is earning without stress and there is no slack season you can continue this uh, injection till a much later age when you can stop your operating thing but you can still continue with your uh, injection techniques for a much later age and of course i have taught this techniques to many many students of mine and nowadays i am very happy that i am getting a uh, chance to teach this to uh, many others through these webinars and conferences uh, by the initiative taken by dr karne and others in office orthopedics thing thank you thank you very much Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bandari. Uh, so this is a very good tool. I also give a lot of injections. However, my uh, there are two things which I do. Maybe I... yeah, there are two things which I do, especially for the trigger finger. I actually do a percutaneous release with a 18 number needle after giving local anesthesia and before giving steroid. What is your take on it? Yeah, I uh, I actually for triggering actually when the triggering is there. first stage is flexor tenosynovitis where the, with injections you will get good relief but in as you said in this uh, trigger finger where the actual trigger is occurring i will put a uh, bigger needle do some trigger after first give some local anesthetic do some uh, needling and then inject and usually even trigger fingers don't need surgery i have not really operated on trigger uh, fingers or trigger thumbs for quite a long time and get that you uh, even if frozen shoulder what i was saying i was really doing manipulation and anesthesia so many times But the patients my, themselves taught me this because patients were coming from far away places. They were not ready for anesthesia. Or they were not fit because of diabetes. So I gave them the first injection and and called them for uh, manipulation under anesthesia for the second injection. And by that time they used to come and say, "We have more than fifty percent relief. Why you want to do this manipulation under anesthesia at all? Just inject us." And for thereafter, I have started uh, realizing that even without uh, GM um, Muga, what we call. Uh, we can get good relief only with properly given injections at weekly intervals and a lot of uh, mobilization uh, exercises at home and if they have locally i can i call them for the short wave diathermy and ult, uh, ultrasonic therapy or the interfacial therapy under my physiotherapy uh, guidance right uh, yes sir so, yeah so i have, I have doc oh continue continue yes is arun sir please uh, i am dr mukherjee and uh, thank you for your uh, illumination and uh, uh, very good uh, speak but only thing there is a confusion in the listeners mind that what is the amount of dipometrol and what is the concentration of dipometrol uh, in every site so uh -huh. first thing that uh, uh, i just wanted to know that there are certain tender points like in decurvens when you inject you don't inject that much amount of fluid yeah. in in knee you amount uh, that that is the maximum amount you can push in the knee but uh, the message is that you should be ready to throw away the remaining part of the dipometrol when the site of inflammation is small or minuscule that is the time when you need only one drop uh, you are taking it please yeah yeah see so what i will tell you i have it even used for many uh, finger sprains PIP or DIP, the only one drop is sufficient. One drop is sufficient. Uh, yes. For the smaller joints, wrist, etc., half a mil. I said half a mil of dipometrol or twenty milligram of dipometrol. For knee joint, I am not giving intraarticular at all. I am giving periarticular. That each spot, I am giving uh, one mil of uh, that is forty milligram of dipometrol. For shoulder, I am giving one mil of uh, that is eighty milligram, forty uh, milligram of methylprednisolone. For fibromyalgia, plantar fasciitis, I am giving one mil of. Uh, I always mix it. with a uh, local anesthetic so that patient don't get stretch pains and i also also give along with an in, uh, injectable analgesic so they don't give it pain so it depends on the size of the joint in a smaller joint half ml or even one drop may be sufficient half ml may be sufficient one ml usually for many other spots and total 2 ml i will sometimes give for the facetal injection or something or the 
sometimes uh, say a very severely uh, painful shoulder. I may give two ml uh, to begin with for the first injection. But usually 40 milligram of one ml at one spot is sufficient and for smaller joints even uh, less than that. 20 milligram or even 10 milligram may be sufficient. That, that is clear. Thank you. Thank you. Many times after giving these steroid injections, patients do come back with white patches around the uh, injection site. Yes. What, what do you do for that? Basically, this happens only uh, in superficial uh, locations if you are giving. In knee joint or in uh, shoulder joints, I have never observed it. Uh, it as I said, the ulnar collateral ligament sprain or something like this. This spot, sometimes you can get that. And so actually, if you dilute them properly with the xylocaine, usually this uh, thing I have not... Uh, previously, I was giving it just the only local uh, steroid. But nowadays, I dilute it with uh, the xylocaine. And usually, this problem I have not encountered much. Maybe one in thousand or something like that. Have you, have you ever come across anaphylactic reaction because of use of xylocaine? Fortunately not. One in five lakh, probably still not. Bandari, yeah. when, uh, Bandari, whenever you are giving steroid injection, you yeah. are using uh, xylocaine also, no? Yeah. So that amount is also vary as per the joint? Yeah, so uh, uh, for a knee joint, I will usually take 3 ml of xylocaine and 2 ml of uh, the methylpenicillin. Uh, and then I don't give them separately. I mix them together and give half of it uh, at one spot, at one spot, and the remaining half up at the up, uh, other spot. What about I, the what, what about what the finger joints? Finger joint, hardly as I said, one drop of xylocaine, one drop of uh, thing is sufficient. But they get very good relief. These people who had uh, some ball injury or something, they have they come with six months, one year or two years having pain uh, using that finger. And you just inject, either it is at the proximal attachment or the uh, distal attachment, either on the ulnar side or the radial side. Only one spot is painful. You inject one drop uh, along with one drop of xylocaine there, and they are really getting very, very good relief, which they don't have for the last one or two years. That is my experience. Thank you, Bandar. Yeah. 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 So, uh, just small comment on uh, the discussion that we are having about the steroid injections. So, especially the chronic spot uh, spots that Dr. Uh, Mandari was talking about, where there is osteoarthritis and ligament, uh, you know, attachments, especially in the knee joint or you know any other places where there has been a ligament injury and or laxity of the ligament, and that is causing the pain. Uh, rather than steroid, I will prefer to do something called as prolotherapy, which is basically, uh, you know, you can use different agents for that, uh, like even platelet rich plasma, or you can use a dextrose uh, solution, which is dilute 25%, you can dilute and then use it. You might have to do it two, three times, but that actually uh, helps a lot, especially those who have this ligament attachments uh, where, you know, there is an injury or ligaments are causing the pain. Steroids uh, do have specific role, especially uh, I think where there is a you know high level of inflammation, uh, such as uh, tennis elbow or plantar fasciitis, uh, where it works wonderfully. But if it is a osteoarthritis of the knee, uh, I'll prefer to do uh, injection with prolotherapy agents, especially at the tender spot. That's, that's that what I want to say is that uh, I agree with this uh, PRP etc., which I am also doing as I said for TA insertional tendons etc. But uh, Dr. Ajit Shinde was my uh, lecturer at that time and Dr. Ayer was my teacher. So these people have taught us these uh, techniques and I have modified them over the years and I am getting very good. I have not found any complication of giving uh, one ml of or half ml of uh, steroid at these ligament spots. I was a bit uh, worried in the beginning. But oh, the, those patients come many times to me after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And I have not found anything. I have used in close relatives and many friends and everything. So now I'm confident that even if I inject uh, steroid, there's no uh, side effect as such, long-term side effect as such. And so if it is giving them good relief, I'm continuing with that. Uh, maybe we are old timers. You are a bit uh, fresher ones. But our experience tells us this. And so many times you go with your own experience. Right, sir. I don't have that experience probably and whatever I have read about it and uh, the research papers which uh, talk about is uh, at the ligament attachments, go for prolo agents. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll yeah. just uh, see and 
do that sometimes yeah so thank you dr bandari for uh, eye opener presentation so this will definitely help us in our practice actually uh, ashok one one last comment i actually want to say that many others should take up this thing and uh, as i said more than 1994 every time joint uh, osteoarthritis go for total joint it is not essential many patients can and many people are not willing many people are not affording just don't give them any cids give them these injections and they will be really help a lot and i want to spread this to many other people many other students and many people so that it is done at all places and many patients are benefited this is the yes. main thing definitely thank you sir uh, so our next uh, talk is on chronic low back pain with normal imaging dr kiran shete from pune my 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 good friend uh, i request him to please Uh, carry on this presentation <clears throat> uh, thank you uh, dr ashok and uh, the panelists uh, today i am going to uh, talk on a very specific uh, subset of uh, back pain patients which is uh, chronic back pain not acute and uh, those uh, whose imaging studies have come absolutely normal there is no uh, you know pathological finding that you can see in fact quite a lot of patients which come to us in the initial phases of uh, their back pains uh, fall in this category and there are few who come uh, you know after repeated visits to the doctors so let's uh, dive into the uh, topic uh, just a minute let me minimize this yeah so today i'm going to talk about what is uh, chronic lbp that we are talking about the approach to uh, such patients uh, identifying the causation and etiopathology treatment about it and a little bit about what research says so low back pain is it a symptom or a disease and i always uh, you know uh, tell this to whoever uh, wherever i talk about low back pain is uh, don't convert it into a disease it's a simple symptom it's just a symptom where the patient is in agony and has pain and we need to treat his pain now the disease or issue in his body can be n number of things and we need to identify the dis uh, uh, disease and then treat that disease so that the symptom of low back pain will go away many a times the low back pain itself is considered as a diagnosis which i don't think uh, is a good idea especially because uh, uh, it has also become uh, you know one of the escape route for the patients for so uh, you know so many other things uh, in their life uh, though it is harmless in many that as we know 80% of people will suffer and that statistics is well known uh it has been there and it will remain there but it is life changing in few i am sure you must have seen a lot of patients in your opd where they have n number of reports and x rays and mris and everything with them hundreds of doctors visits kilos of painkillers liters of ointment and still they are in pain and you know their life has changed they have changed their jobs their partners have left and uh, you know from uh, well earning to low earning to not enjoying their life at all so this uh, chronic low back pain is very important to be treated from its root or identifying the causation and then going to the root of it many times there is no specific identifiable pathology and we'll go forward and see how we can you know treat such patients as well uh patients usually come as acute uh, pain and they can be treated very easily the protocols are well set for that but which acute pains might get into chronic pain nobody knows right so we really want keep first time when the patient comes to us in a acute pain can we do something where this patient gets treated and he doesn't get into a chronic low back pain of course chronic low back pains can start insidiously and you know go slowly slowly increase pain but many a time there is always a episode or acute pain uh, which comes and then there is a chronic uh, chronicity so any pain which is more than 3 or more months is called as chronic low back pain and that's what we are going to treat here that is Uh, you know quite a bit number of uh, differential diagnosis that you can see on uh, uh, chronic low back pain but today we are going to talk about very specific patients where there is a normal x ray that is uh, the imaging studies normal mri and normal ct scan this is what the three imaging studies that i am going to talk about where all these are normal but still patient has a chronic pain chronic is more than 3 months and you know he is uh, trying to get a solution that is what the subset that we are trying to talk here so the approach is very simple as we approach to any chronic uh, pain patients uh, especially starts with the detailed history and as we know that especially in chronic conditions history is 
paramount importance especially how the pain started uh, and then going into the details of not only into the personal history including smoking alcohol his job the kind of work that he is doing sleeping habits uh, and then of course the relationship that the patient has uh you know any traumatic event that he has gone through the treatments that he has done the multiple doctors with everything in history is very crucial especially when the patient is with a chronic low back pain then i am not saying only examination but skillful examination uh, many times in our busy opds when the chronic low back pain patients come to us especially you know when there is a medical college and you know a lot of uh, patients has to be seen uh, most of the times you know the prescription is given and then the patient is asked to come again next time or sometime you know go and get a x ray or get a mri and that is like you know going to give us the perfect guideline and perfect uh, uh, identification of the reason and then we treat it but believe me in chronic patients when we do skillful examination we will be able to get to most of the reasons why there is a pain so history itself will give more than 50% of diagnosis and then the 30 40% will become will come from the uh, skillful examination in that you will have to do uh, uh, all types of tests including of course the basic examination which is uh, inspection palpation and uh, movements but along with that sensory neurological examination the joints nearby and very important to actually uh, you know see the low back area uh which is very important because there are some pathologies which you can identify just looking at the low back area taking out the shirt of the patient or you know in in case of female patient you need to have you need to be careful but make sure that you look at the low back area when you are going to uh, treat that patient for chronic low back pain after examination if there is a need of course you might have to go for selected imaging either you choose a x ray mri or ct scan based on your clinical suspicion uh and uh then you can evaluate it of course after that if required uh, laboratory tests which might be required if everything comes normal let's say there is a imaging which comes normal the lab tests come normal and then you know the real exploration starts what is it that is causing the pain to the patient and you know you have treated them basically with you know a lot of things but still there is no relief and patient is coming repeatedly and this search for the uncommon is very important that's what we'll uh, go in for the slides and see and i will talk about the uh, treatment and the regular follow ups so the first thing is when let's say you have initially after your examination history and everything advise that you think clinically that the patient needs mri scan and you directly send the patient of mri scan you have not done x ray though i i always prefer to get a x ray done so let's say mri comes absolutely normal scan ke there is no dust there is no degeneration there is no soft tissue injuries or any uh, compression of the nerve roots or sinuses now you reevaluate the patient revisit the clinical examination maybe the history also if you clinically find that no patient has some uh, structural pathology patient has some anatomical abnormality which needs to be seen either of the imaging then you might have to go for another form of imaging which can be either ct scan or x ray and there are many condition which are seen on uh, ct and x ray and not seen on mri i think we can have another lecture for that or if you feel that you know the mri quality is not good or you think the sequence which was done was not proper you want uh, uh, you know uh, t2 images to be repeated or uh, want some kind of a you know different angles to be done repeat the mri you might have to go send patient to the uh, second center but your clinical suspicion is very important if you are clinically very sound that patient has a problem and you know there has to be some structural abnormality go for repeat mri absolutely no problem either you can repeat the mri of the uh, same area or you can consider again after clinical evaluation if the mri is to be done for example for lumbosacral plexus and there might be a plexopathy or you want to do a mri of you know the patient is getting radiating pain of sciatic nerve in the buttock and you might just find a, a sciatic uh, you know a, a, a neuroma or some kind of a tumor in the sciatic nerve and believe me i have Uh, uh you know diagnose patients of that uh, conditions as well so it's important that your clinical and uh, suspicion is very important so not that every mri will be exactly the way uh, you know uh, you projected it to be there might be surprises but if you are very conv uh, uh, convinced about your clinical examination go for another imaging or a, uh, a repeat mri for the same patient if the patient has got mri from somewhere else you might have to repeat it so as i said if you are not very sure 
uh, then of course you can go to the next stage but very sure clinically then go for repeat there is also a, a, a mri where there is actual loading which can be done so actual loading mri might reveal conditions which are not seen on a normal, normal mri so as we know the patients usually are sitting moving around traveling and you know their pain increases uh, while doing those activities mri is done while lying down supine comfortably in a ac environment you know most of the time listening to the music so probably actual loading mri which might be helpful to find out a condition where there is you know a, a, a bulging disc might be seen or there might be some disruption in the uh, tissues so you can consider that actual loading if you are clinically very sure Supportive other imagings like obliques and stress X-rays, uh, you know, flexion extension X-rays. Everything can be done, especially because uh, uh, you suspect there is something else going on there. Now, let's say that CT scan and you know shows you something, and then you do the diagnosis, and of course the treatment can go on. But even after doing CT, MR, X-ray, and repeat MRI or other imaging like contrast and everything, uh, even doing a bone scan to find out if there is any you know hidden. Uh, a tumors which can be identified there is nothing and then your exploration starts and that is also another very important aspect of treating these chronic lbp patients now there might be uh, you know uh, a chance that before going exploration we can just consider this as a uh, 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 chronic low back pain you know name it at send it to physiotherapy give him painkillers give him everything and then go for the exploration or you can directly go for exposure depending on at what time the patient has come to you. If patient has already done physiotherapy, all other medications and everything, then you need to identify other reasons for it. So for the simplicity purpose, I have divided you know, further uh, evaluation based on uh, these headings, which I'll go into uh, details one by one. So first is biochemical, where you need to, or systemic illness that you can say, you need to identify basically blood test or lab test, which, we have to, which you have to order. So initial uh, phases of seronegative spondyl arthropathy, ankylosing spondylitis, or the patient might be having, you know, psoriatic arthropathy, they can present where there is only a back pain and there is no identifiable uh, uh, structural abnormality, which can be seen on imaging. Uh, other inflammatory uh, conditions such as increased uric acid or uh, rheumatoid arthritis and other uh, rheumatoid conditions also can give rise to back pain where there is no structural abnormality, especially in young patients. Uh, we need to be careful while ordering the blood test for them. Vitamins are, again, contributory reasons for the back pain, but they are at times, you know, I have patients where you just correct the vitamin D or B12 deficiencies and the patient's pain just goes away, even if they don't do exercise. And that's another way of looking at, you know, when you want to alter the blood test, go for at especially B12 and vitamin D. Other micronutrients, uh, if you feel that patient is uh, has some genetic uh, history or, you know, uh, history of congenital problems where there are deficiencies of uh, some micronutrients, again, you can test them or they are coming from some endemic areas, then go for it. Other important thing, and especially this also is being seen in young population, which is basically uh, osteopenia or osteoporosis. Uh, and nowadays, these 30, 35 year olds are coming with uh, loss of calcium or calcium deficiencies. Uh, especially osteoporosis or osteopenia and other metabolic conditions which can be hyperparathyroidism uh, or uh, thyroid conditions. So these patients also need to be evaluated and especially on imaging at times osteopenia may not get diagnosed and you might have to uh, order uh, their alkaline phosphatase and parathyroid hormones and other tests. So metabolic conditions. So any systemic illness can also cause a back pain and probably they come to you directly with a back pain. In fact, nowadays, we might have seen that patients with viral arthralgias and COVID, they also visited us uh, for back pain and then they later on develop symptoms of COVID or they didn't develop symptoms, but actually were the patients of COVID. So you need to get into the lab test or biochemical approach or systemic conditions which can be identified. Now, these are very specific subset of patients where patients have taken multiple treatments, chronic low back pain and normal imaging. Now, I'm going to the biomechanical uh, reasons for it. And these are another areas where we need to you know, put our efforts into. If, let's say the labs comes absolutely normal. There is nothing into it. So the simple conditions which can be uh, lumbosacral sprain or especially uh, because there are so many ligaments around the lumbosacral area. Lumbosacral strain because of patients, you know, some sports activity repeatedly, his sitting habits, uh, his sleeping habits, uh, probably, or he's working on a shop floor and any condition that can lead to uh, strains. 
Uh, other area where we usually don't look into is the pelvic because X-ray when we do most of the times it doesn't include uh, it doesn't show us the uh, ilium bones or the pelvic uh, bones where there is a you know uh, either there is upslip or downslip based on the uh, you know where there is a pelvic uh, uh, sacroiliac joint migration. There is another condition called as pelvic tilt. If the patient has anterior pelvic tilt excessively or less, and based on that, the lordosis might get affected. Again, imaging will be absolutely normal. There may not be any change in the lordosis, especially if patient's X-ray is being taken in the lying down position. So you might have to also assess clinically. Also, you can see whether there is a pelvic tilt when the patient's uh, you know stands. Uh, so that is another area where we need to find out whether there is a biomechanical reason. So I'm not talking about only mechanical reason because mechanical might include, you know, other mechanical conditions like fractures, which can be seen on imaging, but these are the conditions which are not seen on imaging. Ligament laxity, especially those who have hypermobility. And uh, as we know, there's a hypermobility syndrome where the patient's ligaments themselves are very hypermobile and they get repeated uh, injuries to their sacroiliac joints or lumbosacral joints. And that's where I come to sacroiliac joint dysfunction. This is another area which is most of the times ignored in our OPDs. And there are very simple tests uh, which you can do. Most of it is we'd only figure out four and then we forget about SI joints. No, there are five tests which you can do for sacroiliac joint, uh, including Ganslin's test and compression test and distraction test. And at least do this test and find out if there is a sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Of course, the tender point might vary because it may not be exactly on the SI joint. And in many a times when the tenderness is on the posterior superior ILX, uh, ILX spine, uh, uh, it is confused with sacroiliac joint or lumbosacral ligament. So you need to identify the sacroiliac joint dysfunction and differentiate it with the lumbosacral strain or strain. Uh, it's very important to identify a sacroiliac joint dysfunction because it can become uh, uh, a reason for a chronic unresolved pain which can disturb patient's life uh, uh, because of you know untreated or repeated treatment not giving any results. Even the physiotherapists many times won't be able to treat that condition. And you might have to go for sacroiliac joint injections or you know do diagnostic injection first. So you know, another area where you can go into is that if you feel there is a sacroiliac joint dysfunction and you are confused whether it is actually sacroiliac joint or the reason of the pain is something else, sacroiliac joint pain can radiate to lateral side of the thigh even till the calf uh, because of the now supplies or nerve roots which are coming from there. So make sure that the sacroiliac joint diagnostic block is done. So inject a local anesthesia into the sacroiliac joint find out if the patient immediately gets a pain relief and that's confirmed that it's a sacroiliac joint problem. And then you can go for either therapeutic uh, uh, steroid injection or radiofrequency ablation of the sacroiliac joints now supply. Uh, another uh, thing is uh, sarcopenia, especially because of the old age or this can be also nowadays, I have seen a lot of young people coming because of the work from home culture during lockdowns, they were sitting at home, no exercise and their muscles, especially in the low back area, uh, or paraspinal muscles became weak and which is uh, rather the most important muscle that I always test when they are in my OPD is transversus abdominis where you can palpate the transverse abdominis just inside and below the uh, ASIS and tell the patients to contract it a little bit like pull the belly inside and you can feel that muscle and after the experience you will feel that what is the normal strength of that and what is abnormal. So it is very important to identify if there is a generalized skeletal uh, muscle weakness and which can again reflect into the low back or specifically for the low back because of again the posture or the, the, way, the way they are sitting and uh, working there, uh, you know, the posture is very important. So you can identify the sitting arrangements, how many hours they are working, if they are drivers, the kind of cars they are driving, the hours, the rest, the stretches, if there is anything that they are doing. So if you go into details of each and everything, of course, there will be pointers which can guide you to something. Uh, but if there is nothing coming, then you need to do this step by step. Other area which now let's say everything comes normal. So I'm going now into deeper and that's basically your microscopic changes which are not seen on imaging or not in biochemical uh, ways or we are not able to identify uh, in a biomechanical way where you know we uh, don't think that there is any uh, biomechanical abnormality. So there might be microscopic things which are not yet seen on the imaging. And one of the thing is uh, 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 in, uh, intervertebral uh, internal disc disruption, where it is the early phase of degeneration, where you know the the water content is there, but the breakage of the uh, um, uh, the lamella in the annulus fibrosus has started. 
and that's where the internal idd or uh, this disruption process starts giving pain because there will be ingrowth of the blood vessels coming from the periphery and that's where the sinovertebral nerves will get irritated and patient will get pain which is mainly discogenic pain but the mri is normal and mri is normal because the water content is still there and it is you know you don't see that blackening of the disc on the t2 uh, images on the mri so IDD and of course you can again go with the diagnostic discography, diagnose it and then treat it by uh, annuloplasty procedure where you can you know ablate sinovertebral nodes with radio frequency currents. Inflammatory again, uh, these are enthesiopathies which might be there and we might be able to catch up them in the lab test. But if, as you know, 20% of the patients with ankylosing spondylitis will have HLA-B27 negative even if done with PCR method. So. There might be such kind of patients where there is an inflammation, there is an enthesiopathy, but we are not able to diagnose them on either imaging or biochemically. Myopathy, and this is another condition which uh, we need to, uh, we might have to take a help from uh, our uh, neurologist friends where they can do uh, EMG studies and find out if there is a myopathy conditions which are coming. Chronic spasm, this is another uh, area where everything is normal, but the patient has pain. Many reasons for chronic pains, especially because of the uh, patient's postures and the alignments that they do while they are working. Myofacial nodules, of course, you can palpate them uh, many a times, but there are deeper nodules, especially in the ligaments, which are not palpable, and triggers which are formed. Uh, these are also sometimes the ligament triggers are not palpable, especially in the lumbosacral area. So these are microscopic uh, changes which happen. And that's why many times you will find that these conditions can be diagnosed and treated. But for the nodules, sometimes these people uh, or you might have seen uh, people offering these local low back injections and they inject normal saline or at times prolo agents. And after three, four injections, weekly intervals, patient gets absolutely okay. Why they get okay? Because the ligaments which are there, they go to the facet joints and the ligaments uh, areas where Actually, it helps for the healing. If there are triggers, then it will be released. Or if there are noodles, now there is this uh, treatment which is commonly done, especially because the uh, you know nothing is happening. Orthopedic surgeons tell that you know go to physiotherapy. Physiotherapists are not able to help with exercise. Then they do something called as dry needling. Now this is another area where actually the muscles where the triggers are formed are released with this dry needling and the healing potential happens. Then there is, there is no structural uh, change you can see on MRI, but these are the microscopic changes which happen and they are healed with the uh, dry needling and you know other needling techniques that are used. Uh, probably acupuncture also might be working on the same way. So after the microscopy, let's say we go for, and again, for the diagnosis of these conditions, you have to have clinical suspicion and go for a diagnostic uh, injection. For example, for IDD, you might have to consider do a discography and for triggers and uh, you know other things, you might have to go diagnostic blocks where you feel there is a uh, uh, you know uh, facet joint problem, you do a diagnostic facet joint block and then see if there is a relief. So of course, these become interventions, but if the patient has a chronic pain for more than uh, you know years and the, there is no relief and everything is normal, you might have to consider this. I am coming to neurobiology now. Now, I, am, I have kept this a little late because most of the times when we don't find anything on the X-ray or MRI or imaging, we label the patient as supratentorial. I think we should avoid that and try and find if there is actually some reason for it. And then at the end, you can go and say that, you know, probably patient is a psychosomatic pain. Probably some kind of a mental trauma has happened and the patient is having problems. Many a times the chronic fatigue syndrome, anxiety, depression might be associated with, uh, you know, chronic low back pain. But believe me, fibromyalgia is another condition which is very particular, very specific, which uh, needs treatment and can be treated. Because fibromyalgia is not that the patient has a psychological uh, issue and, you know, he is uh, just uh, needs a psychiatric treatment. Uh, but he needs a proper treatment for fibromyalgia, which includes multidisciplinary approach where you need exercises, you need a psychological counseling, you need tablets, we need uh, vitamin supplements, mobilizations and exercise, ergonomic guidance, massages, at times Ayurvedic treatments, and they do really well. So by just labeling them as a psychosomatic, it doesn't solve the problem of the patient and even it won't solve the problem of yours because you will be just thinking it's yeah, psychosomatic and you know probably you will be referring them to multiple places but the patient will not get the relief because he needs uh, a, a 
perfect diagnosis first and then based on that a multidisciplinary treatment approach other condition is neuropathy you might have um, also you know come across patients of a neuropathy coming to you as a back pain uh, recently i uh, uh, saw a patient uh, two days back uh, hiramayas of course that happens in cervical spine hiramayas disease where he was a avid gymer going to gym every day and you know he had this severe neck pain and not able to find out anything on mris and everywhere and where actually uh, he started getting uh, weakness and all that because of the pain uh, he didn't know what to do so when we did actually his uh, ncv studies we could see there is anterior horn cell degeneration which is happening and it is very common seen in people who do uh, very heavy gymming because of the continuous flexion of the cervical spine and similar anterior horn degenerations can also happen in lumbar spine uh, so neuropathy is another a condition which need to be identified now why these patients get a uh, uh, excessive pain is because the ascending pathway uh, facilitation and descending pathway inhibition so the pain which is carried is basically substance p nerve growth factors and glutamate and the inhibition pathway which helps it to basically you know reduce the uh, the pain sensation which is serotonin dopamine and other factors so in case of fibromyalgia it has been found that in csf you will have increased level of substance p and glutamate and the reduced levels of uh, uh, inhibiting uh, chemicals neurochemicals and that is the reason why they get pain so there is a actual reason why they get this pain it is not just in their mind but there is are chemical changes which are happening in the pain pathways and there is a hypersensitization of these pain pathways where they get let's say there is a pain there is a physical problem but actually they perceive it very excessive so there is a pain let's say normally it should cause a pain on vas scale from 1 to 10 only 2 but the patients who have hypersensitization they will perceive that pain up to 8 10 even you touch them and they will be like you know i can't just bear this pain so uh, uh, make sure that you, uh, you know you identify whether they are actually having a psychosomatic issue or there are some uh, diagnosis which can be there uh, for neurobiology now after everything is normal you also need to look at the surrounding uh, you know pathologies which can be there in central nervous system like you know patients with uh, at times uh, uh, in fact uh, you know, patients with uh, uh, parkinsons or some other conditions degenerative condition in the spine uh, brain can also present with a generalized body pain and a back pain cervical myelopathy at times you know cervical spine condition everything is fine but the patient has only back pain and radiating to lower limbs uh, hip conditions can condi uh, and you know there are many other areas other thing which i want you to understand is a neuralgia and why i wanted you to you know see the patient's back when the patient is complaining back uh this is a condition where you know the female was there and she was not very comfortable showing me the you know back area of course i called my uh, i always have a female assistant with me uh when i'm examining a female patient especially in the low back area and that's where i could see that she actually has a herpes and she didn't know that because it's a old age and she just has a back pain and even before the rash comes the patient starts getting pain for 3 4 days and then the rash starts and then everything starts but after this rash is over which is acute patients might land up into chronic neuralgias and that leads to the back pain and that is where we are here right now so patient might have got a herpes got treated nobody knows she had actually herpes and then or she might not have got treated got self self healed and patient has a neuralgia so going into details uh, of the history as well as examination is very important sacroiliitis is another condition where it can present like a disc or even radiating pain to the legs so you can look at the surrounding areas and the last which i want to not forget is malingenious because these are some people who have some self motives or selfish interests to always show that you know i have a pain and again i don't have to tell you who these guys will be but there are you know wardle signs which you can uh, test this test uh, and you can find out whether the patient is malingering or actually has a you know actual pain so uh, i will uh, name these uh, different little different from actual psychosomatic because uh, psychosomatics will have actually a issue uh, but these patients don't have a issue neither in the uh, neurology nor in their pain pathways but they actually are just trying to fool you around so that they can get a leave or you know do something with their life so these are main conditions approaches and issues that you can identify for the patients who have uh, chronic low back pain but the imaging is absolutely normal so you can see the chronic low back pain is multifactorial and especially those who have absolutely no findings in 
imaging, they can have multiple reasons for it. Now, many a times, because of the lifestyle that we are going through, the aging population, you will always have something on X-ray or MRI. But please remember, that may not be the actual reason for the pain. That may be just associated or, you know, the finding in the uh, MRI. As we know, if you do the uh, MRIs of 100 people, you 60, 70, 80 percent will have some kind of a disc or some kind of a degeneration in their spine. Doesn't mean that they have pain or doesn't mean that the source of their pain is from that pathology or that the anatomical defect that you have seen. There can be anything which I just spoke about and we need to identify that and treat that. And the best treatment for that is actually considering that pain is not only because of the, you know, let's say there is a compression of the uh, nerve root or the disc degeneration. It is also perceived in the mind and, you know, any psychological stress for that matter, even people who don't have psychiatric illnesses, but is under stress will lead to aggravation of the or sensitization of the nerves and lead to more pain. If that is not treated, again, more stress, more pain, and they'll end up into this chronic pain cycle. So it is important while you are treating approach. So that's what I follow at uh, my clinic, Spinology Clinic, where we do multidisciplinary treatment, where we involve different specialists, including, of course, orthopedic and some injections if required, nutritional counseling, stress management, if required, complementary therapies, which can have massage, Ayurveda, ergonomics, which is basically postural therapies, mobilizations, manual therapy, physiotherapy, and all this based on what condition patient is, is offered to him. And especially those who have uh, psychosomatic uh, problems, they will need multiple of these treatments and multiple doctors involved in the treatment of them. There is enough evidence which is shown to, uh, which has shown that uh, multidisciplinary treatments absolutely fantastic for the patients with chronic low back pain. This is uh, my own paper, which was published uh, since I'm just overshooting my time, I'll just skip these slides so that we can go to discussions if there is any. This is a, a, another paper which are published where we, uh, this is not for uh, chronic low back pain with normal imaging, but this is for people with slip disc having uh, radiating pain where multidisciplinary treatment worked absolutely fantastic for these patients and excellent results with them. So in summary, chronic low back pain is very common, especially those who have uh, you know, no changes on their imaging studies, need to investigate, find out if required, do diagnostic procedures. Remember that it's a multifactorial pathology, needs a multidisciplinary treatment. And of course, the treatment is evolving. You might have to involve other people in the treatment. And there is no magic pill or magic treatment which can fit everybody, especially those with chronic pain. So that's what I wanted to talk about. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Any questions for Dr. Kiran? Uh, uh, Dr. Kiran, uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. But uh, can you illuminate also on the topic that a orthopedic surgeon should be able to read an MRI of a spine? Because the MRI described by a radiologist is altogether speaks of a, in a different tune that we are not a, the, a person who cannot read an MRI is totally at the mercy of the report. So what we are talking about that because the MRI has become a household investigation like X-ray in the past. So there should be, uh, there should be classes how to read a spine MRI because so many spine MRI, which are said to be pathological are practically normal. So that gives a very, uh, uh, and the patient is being uh, suggested surgery or different modality of treatment, which to which he, it is, um, uh, most of the doctors are not agreeable. So what should be done in these cases? So, uh... In case of, you know, MRI, MRI is my, honestly, uh, is, is the last investigation that I consider. Uh, but if I'm going to do MRI, and usually when I uh, send my patients for MRI, I write down what is exactly that clinically I'm suspecting. 
because sending just for MRI, the radiologist has no clue what exactly is you know is being done. Usually, if I am sending to uh, you know the centers in my area, they all know, and uh, my radiologist and I usually talk for almost you know every day for uh, you know uh, discussing any report of the MRI. If I am going to uh, you know patient is going to go anywhere else, then or otherwise also, I write down that you know I am suspecting L four five disc and probably compressing on the right side, and that's where you know things are going very bad. Uh, or if I am suspecting uh, stenosis or facet degeneration or anything, tumor or whatever in my mind, that is one. Secondly, we need to get trained in reading basic MRIs. I'm not saying we should be experts into it, but we should be able to, because many times I have, you know, called my radiologist and told them that you need to change this diagnosis. You need to change the report. You need to identify, you know, there is a, a, a paracentral disc, there is a extra foraminal disc, or uh, can you see that there is something else going on here? And uh, I have been fortunate enough to have radiologists who actually relook at the things and then they change the reports. We need to get basically trained into reading primary uh, things on the MRI. We don't yes. have to be experts into it, but we need to be updated about it. That's for sure. Thank you. That's exactly what the message is, that you should be primarily able to read the MRI and then read the report. You first see the MRI, try to read the MRI, try to read the MRI according to the clinical findings and correlate the MRI findings with your clinical findings and then look for them. So this is what the radiologist is not aware about, aware of. The, what are the clinical features? He has not seen the patient. He has not examined the patient. He does not know about the complaints of the patient. And that is the reason he is reading a piece of uh, reflection and we should be giving him proper detail that uh, what has to be seen and where we are concentrating on. That's exactly where we uh, there is a communication between the clinician and the uh, the investigator of course thank you kiran thank you sir thank you sir are there any questions from the audience uh, uh, dr ashok uh, no i, I have not seen okay sir okay. thank you dr kiran so the next next talk will be splints in hand how, where to use. So there are so many splints available uh, in the market. Whenever you write uh, uh, a finger splint, they get some frog splint or something. And uh, this is an age old thing where we do such kind of strapping, strapping of finger. So usually nowadays what it is said is we should not do this strapping. Uh, now, if you see our fingers, they are not at same level. The joints are not at the same level. And uh, uh, because of this, uh, we, we might get stiffness into the other finger also. So, strapping should be a big one. Then, these, there are some other types uh, of bandages, sort of ball, ball bandage or something like that. Uh, again, this has to be avoided. And, this another problem where uh, uh, a plaster has been applied on the water side and uh, the metacarpophalangeal joint is in extension, wrist is in slight flexion. So these things are to be avoided. What is needed is the MCP joint has to be flexed, the wrist has to be extended. So this is the James position which has to be. So nowadays it is said that instead of uh, a volar slap, uh, we always go with the dorsal slap and uh, that that usually maintains that uh, that James position or if we are going for a volar slap, it should not cross the distal palmar crease. So that is what is uh, needed. Again, this, this type of pot splint or something. Now, if, if we see this splint is extended till the MCP joint. So, the movement of MCP joint is also blocked. So, this type of splint is not advisable. And many times what happens is this, this, this strap, they press it so hard that the, uh, the blood supply at the tip of the finger gets affected. So, we should avoid this type of splinting. 
another important uh, thing is elevation so so the injured part should be always above the heart level the cuff and collar thing what is been told is the the cuff part of the button should be attached to the collar part of the shirt so that is cuff and collar so usually it has to be above the uh, uh, heart level so this this position is not acceptable so what what should we look for a finger or hand injury so always see for uh, uh, ask them to flex the fingers whenever you do this so all the fingers they point towards the scapula so this is uh, the called the normal cascade but if there is scissoring like this right or there is some shortening or there is pseudo cloying so this is sort of a pseudo cloying some something like this with this fracture this needs surgery so we should we should go ahead with the surgery and now what types of splints so there are static splint there are dynamic splint there are hybrid splints so we just go one by one so what is the use so it is used for fracture healing we can use for a corrective purpose supportive protective then strengthening of the muscle group relief of pain and facilitate motion hello galat number now this is uh, an out trigger splint uh, where, where where we use this aluminum splints we can make it in our own clinic and uh, it is very useful it can be used in a static way as well as a dynamic Just show you. So here we have applied this this <coughs> aluminium plate on the dorsal side, and this is that suction suction tip. These are these are all very cost effective uh, uh, splints which can be used, and patient is encouraged for mobilization. So the 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 main purpose of treating hand fractures is to give a a mobile mobile hand. so many times we come across with uh, a lot of stiffness the uh, uh, movements are at risk so for that you should we, we should go for dynamic splinting so this is the way we apply we, we take it as a, that aluminum splint we keep a uh, uh, curve upwards and then we can use whatever way on i mean on the bowler side on the dorsal side whatever is the is the uh, need of the patient's hand accordingly we can use it again over here we can see that uh, it, it is been applied on the dorsal side and uh, for the for the ring finger uh, uh, we have applied a, a additional splint so again uh, that this is this is the way in which it acts as a dynamic splint also so a rubber band is applied along the plane and patient can and uh, do the exercises within the tolerance of the patient yes again so so these are all cost effective things because uh, uh, every time a patient may not afford the uh, uh, company braces and this but here we can give so here you see there is a small rubber band this is uh, basically of the gloves so it holds it in in flexion and we just remove that band and ask to extend so we can do a dynamic splinting again we can see now here yes this is the this is that gloves which is used to cover in flexion and these are the rubber band and we remove the gloves and ask to extend and again we can so this is this is done every hour so uh, with this the stiffness part of the uh, uh, which is the which is the main problem in treating hand fractures is almost nil yeah so this is this is the gloves which has been cut and now uh, whenever there is a metacarpophalangeal joint uh, flexion so again again very simple thing so we have just used a, a bandage a clip and these are again uh, gloves and these are the rubber bands so they, they can they can do the active flexion as well as uh, 
passive this. this is easily available in the market so again uh, you can you can just uh, use it to uh, do the finger exercise and get rid of stick the glows part you just give them uh, the cut cut part of this glows like this and ask them to this flexion exercise so <clears throat> that does really work for stick so these are the other splints cock up splint uh, uh, where it is used unstable wrist joint wrist sprain tendinitis digital uh, radial nerve joint injury so <clears throat> what is the objective of this the displacement uh, a passive wrist extension active wrist flexion prevent contracture of unopposed innervated wrist flexor so now we are going towards uh, the nerve injuries now here uh, this is used for ulnar nerve uh, injury which leads to cloying of uh, the ulnar fingers and uh, this type of splint it prevents that thing uh, cloying and it stabilizes fourth and fifth metacarpophalangeals in flexion and it corrects fourth and fifth metacarpophalangeals so it does exactly opposite of cloying uh, with this type of splint now if we have a, a median and ulnar nerve injury this kind of splint helps and uh, it will take care so it gives a complete claw hand this is very useful splint uh, I, I, uh, so in all your dip joint injuries so this is a capnar splint so it, it gives a good so that you have a, a uh, you have a spring over here so that they can do it this dynamic movements along with so for your dip contractures dip flexion contractures tonal deformity this splint is very very useful uh, this is a zimmer splint uh, uh, which which we are using nowadays for pip fractures and dislocations and uh, uh, a mallet mallet splint so in in this mallet splint uh, what we want is a hyper extension at the dip joint and the pip joint should be able to they should be able to flex it so this is the way we apply it so instead of using those spot splints and uh, the, the splints which i showed earlier this is the best way to immobilize a mallet mallet uh, finger so we do some hyper extension at the dip joint and then we use two straps so that the patient can do pip joint flexion uh, that should not go into the body so this is the way we apply it. so these are the other other splints for the mallet finger this is an interesting splint uh, j splint so whenever you, you come across a patient with uh, finger tip injuries and uh, there is a pulp fracture or a distal phalanx fracture with uh, uh, with a wound around so in those uh, those uh, uh, cases we can use this kind of splint so this is sort of a dressing applied and then this is the j splint so it just comes at the uh, dip dip so this is what this is the way it is applied. yes so uh, they can even even do flexion at the dip as well as dip this is a j splint so very useful whenever we come across the injured finger tip injuries out trigger splint again we use this so this can be made in our own clinic so this is an aluminum splint and this is a cushion along that aluminum splint and we can make it we can we can uh, it is a malleable thing so we can uh, make it of whatever shape we want So like this. So with this on, we put a plaster and the short arm splint. So during plaster also, uh, whenever we whenever we are applying a slab, so we make a a center sort of uh, 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 this thing. 
so that the plaster becomes four times stronger it doesn't break so i'll just show you so this is a slab and this center part we just do like this around it so doing that it makes the plaster very strong this is that right Right. Now, ulnar gutter splint. Again, so see the position of hand. There is extension at uh, wrist joint. There is flexion at MCP joint, and the IP joints are extended. So there is a slab on this side, and there is a slab on this slab. It ends over here. So your boxers fractures, your uh, fifth fifth metacarpal, fourth metacarpal fractures. This is a source. So like this, it is applied. This is the dorsal side. Thumb spica again. So we just apply on this side, and again we can see that ridge which is being made. So that makes the plaster very strong. And after putting a slab, I always give a crepe bandage. The advantage is uh, the plaster looks good. It doesn't get uh, soiled. And uh, the the bandage which we use it becomes thready and it comes out easily. But if we use a crepe bandage over a slab, uh, it 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 maintains it in a very fashion. This is thumb spica. Sugar tongs splints. So this is also a very useful splint. So uh, there is always a debate: uh, should we give an above elbow or below elbow cast slab? For distal and radius fractures, so this is a splint where we can uh, uh, it gives answer for both the things. So this this is the slab. This is the ridge which is being made like this, and it should not cross the distal uh, palmar crease over here. And then it goes like this along the elbow, and it uh, it it covers and. So you can immobilize the wrist as well as the elbow. Uh, fracture dislocation PIP joints. So PIP joint injuries. Uh, many times, what we see is uh, uh, we give this uh, body strapping and uh, very casual approach, uh, and it's like nothing. Don't worry. And many times, what it is seen is uh, these two X-rays are done, uh, an AP and oblique. So these two X-rays usually we miss uh, the fracture. What we want is a, a true lateral X-ray so that we can see the joint of the uh, EIP and become a diagnosis. So, so this PIP fractures, if it is less than thirty degree, they are stable. So over here it is stable. Then this is. It unstable. So if these are the fractures, and if there is a dislocation, it has to be treated. So there are so many options available, uh, like extension box, block, splinting, pinning, so many things. So what what we follow is uh, if, if the patient comes early, let's say within ten days, we use this Zimmer fix traction tech. This this works. This really works. If the patient comes late after two weeks, then a Suzuki frame, yes, that also. But if the patient comes very late, uh, let's say two months, three months, and then he has a lot of stiffness, no movement, pain, then we can go with a volar plate arthroplasty or hemia. So extension box block pinning. Then these are some of the other other methods like. Uh, but then uh, there is. Uh, Patient doesn't keep this. Then there is something called extension. These are all splinting methods, uh, but this is only done when the the, the, frac the fracture dislocation is made. So Zimmer static traction. These are this we are using nowadays. Uh, whenever the patient presents early, so this is fracture with dislocation. B sign is positive. That means there is subluxation of the joint. And even the patient had some uh, fracture at the met third metal. So uh, we use this aluminium static splint track uh, nail traction. It is done under local anesthesia. 
first splint is used for three weeks, and then uh, 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 we give a splint, another other dynamic splint for a week, and then so this is the way we do. So we are here. We are giving a, a tendon sheet block. So at this this. So usually our our digital now comes like this, goes here like this. So if we give two ml over here, you can can do. Uh, get a good anesthesia then we take a one zero stitch in the nail bed along with the pulp further we make this aluminium splint and uh, incorporate this aluminium splint in a plaster and now we are fixing the, the so this is the fractured finger and this is the splint zimmer static splint this is the final construct and this is the extract. So nice reduction. So we keep this splint, static splint for three weeks. And uh, once the fracture becomes gummy, then we start all the mobilization techniques we can. So this is after the removal of the splint, we give such kind of a dynamic splint and take the early mobilization. It's over, no? Mm. It's over, you go and change and then you help me get things down. Huh? Yeah. So uh, this this is what is uh, is the message. This this so uh, there was there is uh, there was Dr. Paul Brand, the famous Paul Brand of uh, CMC Wellor, who had a uh, 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 device uh, brand transfer. So during one of his lectures, he he he, he had a one hour lecture and he was keeping his hand like this throughout the lecture his hand was so after the lecture somebody asked him why why are you keeping the hand like this? so he said if you don't understand anything of my lecture if you just understand this thing that the hand is to be kept in this position for immobilization that is enough for me. so that is what is my message uh, intrinsic plus position james position whatever we say so 70 degree of flexion of M MCT joint, 70, 90 degree fine. IP should should be fully extended and wrist should be slightly extended. So this is uh, uh, this is my my OPD where I I, I prepare my own splints and uh, do this splinting in my in my own clinic. Thank you very much. And any questions? Arup, sir, you are online. Yes. Okay. So for the for the next topic, I invite Dr. Arup Mukherjee. You 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 can also use DMARD in rheumatoid arthritis in OPD. Please take over. Am I sharing the screen and am I am I visible and audible? You are visible, audible, but screen is not visible. You are audible, you are visible, but screen is not seen. Just a minute. Sir, you have an option of share screen. Just a minute, share screen. Share screen. Yes.
can you see the last uh, share the screen not yet sir no sir not yet Is it now visible? No. Just a minute. Share the screen goes positive. Is it visible now? Sir, you, no, sir. you will also be able to see once your screen comes on the by i i can see my screen but uh, it is not visible to you all sir again go back go on share screen yeah i am just clicking the share screen i am clicking the article share yes is it all right yes yes yeah okay thank you see uh, thank you dr ashok for your uh, wonderful presentation in hand explains and uh, hand has been my subject of interest for more than 35 years so i could understand what your message is but and again thank you so much for putting it in such a lucid way so now i will be talking about the rational use of dmards in rheumatoid arthritis now there always been a controversy or there has been a word like osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis now arthritis is a chronic inflammatory disorder of varying intensity an unremitting in rheumat unremitting in rheumatoid arthritis where well, osteoarthritis is also a chronic disease with intermittent acute phase as we all know it is the osteoarthritis patient who is intermittently well and intermittently it is in trouble so this is uh, what the clinical picture is but both of the group of the patient suffer from an inflammatory disorder of non infective nature with intermittent flare ups and when the patient comes to the doctor most of these patients have had this experience in the past now they have come to a new doctor or the old doctor who have who has been able to put his inflammation under remission in the past right. or he has come to you with the expectation that you will do it for him now fact what to my definition there has been a lot of confusion in deciding this is osteoarthritis this is rheumatoid arthritis now rheumatoid arthritis being more of a systemic disorder and osteoarthritis being more of a regional disorder but both are inflammatory in nature now genetic inheritance dominates osteoarthritis also osteoarthritis can be put under remission by regular exercise by regular exercises whereas rheumatoid arthritis needs regular medication as well as exercises what makes the situation worse is the moist and a cold weather exposure repeated injuries and exposure to viral infection an osteoarthritis patient or a patient who has got back ache or knee pain a spondyloarthritis patient will get flare up after a minor whiplash injury or a minor sprain of the back or with 
वायरल इन्फेक्शन लाइक चिकनगुनिया और कोविड नाइनटीन लाइक दैट इन्फेक्शन सो द मैसेज वॉट आई वॉन्ट टू से दैट इन आवर पॉपुलेशन देर आर आर्थरेटिक पेशेंट हुइटिस इज स्लीपिंग और हुज आर्थराइटिस इज वाइड अवेक माई एफर्ट is to put this active arthritis into inactive arthritis and we can never cure this patient that is the reason the word remission is being used so that this disease goes into remission that means inactive stage and then the patient can maintain the remission by doing regular exercises now what is the diagnosis arthritis is a systemic autoimmune disorder and will seldom come alone so when there is an autoimmune disease a disease uh, this is arthritis ulcerative colitis and bronchial asthma are three major autoimmune disorder a major autoimmune disorder will never come alone when we see in our opd you see this arthritic patient look for other autoimmune disorders like hyperacidity hypothyroidism hypertension dyslipidemia diabetes obesity and in children of arthritic patient girl children they suffer most commonly with pcod 50% of arthritic patients have lupus disorder and nearly all sle patients have arthritis what is a lupus lupus is an inflammatory disorder of the blood vessel and blood vessel are supplied to all the vital organs of the body so the neurologist is fed up of lupus nephrologist is fed up of lupus the cardiologist is fed up of lupus and we as a the lower limb has got inflammatory cap, uh, disorders in the lower limb that leads to that leads to clotting of the blood vessels in the lower limb and this affects the heart brain and the kidneys together see this is the patient of an arthritis who has got venous thrombosis in the foot the color of the foot and the color of the leg is different because there is a static blood block uh, blood uh, thrombosis in the foot and when i treat these patients the thrombosis resolves and the color of the foot will also turn normal see this is a systemic effect of lupus we call it as a melasma when i treat these patients so the minor autoimmune disorder they get corrected by themselves i don't have to give any separate medicine for them this woman who has uh, the right side picture she she came in this condition and when i started treating this woman with the uh, with my low dose dmard see how the color of the facial skin has started developing to a normal c so melasma is an important sign of an arthritic patient as an associate symptom so i cannot miss these symptom these signs in a arthritic patient see again the same thing this is a deformed foot along with venous thrombosis and uh, discolored dorsum of the foot so most of these patients you will see that hypertensive patients they have dark color skin of the leg and the foot and their feet it is because of venous or vascular thrombosis in the lower limb the lower limb being staying below the level of the heart develops more thrombosis and if this stays for a longer time due and also due to the deficiency of calcium they develop varicose veins and then they develop varicose ulcers and then it becomes 
a non-healing ulcers, which is a challenge to any clinician. So just I will be describing you the what are the associated problems of arthritis. Associated problems by which I can clinch the diagnosis is anemia, hypertension, vitamin D deficiency, or because anemia, hypertension, and vitamin D deficiency are associated with the renal involvement in the arthritis, that is the lupus. 50% of arthritic patients have lupus disorder and the kidneys are affected, the liver is affected, and when the kidneys are affected, which leads to anemia, hypertension, and vitamin D deficiency. So when I correct this arthritis business in a patient, anemia corrects, hypertension settles, vitamin D deficiency comes to nearly normal, although I have to inject uh, or uh, give associated uh, vitamin D sub supplements and the patient improves in many factors. The chronic lupus disorder causes permanent atherosclerosis and associated life-threatening emergencies like stroke and CVA. So arthritic patients are especially men are highly vulnerable to cardiac emergencies like heart attack or uh, strokes. So whenever I see an arthritic patient who has a sedentary lifestyle, who has been complaining of backache for a long time, and who has been, uh, who has a blood pressure, who has dyslipidemia, I send them first for a TMT to my cardiologist associate so that a impending heart attack can be ruled out in men especially, but women also suffer from it though in lesser frequency. What is the role of DMARDs? My way of giving DMARD is a way in which I can limit the activity of the disease for decades after I have diagnosed the problem. This limits the hyperactivity of the autoimmune disorder, also reduces the general immunity. Then all autoimmune disorders are not equally severe as arthritis, like diabetes, hypothyroidism, blood pressure, acidity, these are autoimmune disorder, but not as intense as arthritis or asthma or ulcerative colitis is. These can be managed by individual medication, like taking hypertensive medicines and, this, and a thyroid supplement. But when you manage arthritis, they get corrected automatically. So when you correct arthritis by DMARDs, all the minor disorders get corrected or get modified like in, we see in diabetes, hypertension, hypothyroidism, which are commonly associated with arthritis. Why I use commonly used DMARDs? These are age old, well-practiced DMARDs. We know their side effects. We know their dosing schedule and we can manage and identify their uh, adverse reactions much before by simply looking at the blood test. So these are the five uh, commonly used DMARDs in my prescription. How an orthopedician is concerned? One cannot separate orthopedics from rheumatology. Why? Because most of the orthopedic surgery is addressing chronic degenerative disease of joints and spine. Why there is a degeneration more in some patients, some person, there is less degeneration in some person. That is a matter of genetics and genes and it's the penetration of the genes. We inherit arthritis from our generations, but our lifestyle makes the gene more 
penetrable and the manifestation of the disease is more common in a sedentary lifestyle in a malnourished uh, person or in a person who is moving where the pollution is at a higher level as a true specialist one should be knowing the preventive aspect of the disease and its pathogenesis so it may be but when a person goes and asks how can i prevent a joint replacement from a joint replacement surgeon it is a laughable thing because the joint replacement surgeons main income is from replacing the joint and you can't ask a joint replacement surgeon how to prevent the joint replacement which is his bread and butter what is a safe regime of demards now demards are fought with certain amount of uh, certain amount of fear in clinicians that it may cause into side effects or adverse effects of the demards but where but a regime should be that safe that merely on a suspicion of a autoimmune disease you can start the regime without causing serious side effect that should be the hallmark of a safe regime that means after the basic blood test x ray and ultrasound hold abdomen one can give a therapeutic trial of the regime and see the response after a month so this has been my this has been my hallmark of the treatment that i don't go into any major blood test like getting ntccp done or even getting uh, uh, so many other uh, expensive tests and come pathological tests because these pathological tests are positive today and negative tomorrow and it is very difficult to say that in spite of all these tests there are hardly any test which can bring all the patients suffering from a low grade autoimmune disorder or arthritis into a diagnostic net my recommended regime does not contain any painkiller i never give painkiller to my patients the relief is beyond doubt about the diagnosis if my diagnosis is correct the patient will get relief in the pain within a month that confirms my diagnosis because minor arthritic patients never come as zero positive patients now mukherjee's regime is what mukherjee's regime is a combination or a cocktail of many disease modifying drugs in a very moderate and a minimal way so that none of the drug causes any significant side effect in the patient the patient has to be tested for basic blood test and an ultrasound whole abdomen to know what is his status before the treatment this is what i give for a zero positive rheumatoid arthritis means those at least the patient who are at least zero positive they should get the treatment like this for at least 3 months and in my experience where i have written more than 6 lakh prescriptions on the same mode and same pattern for all india patients they behave very well with this treatment but i keep a touch with my patient so that in case they find any trouble they get back to me but rarely i have found that the patient within a month has come with a particular uh, adverse reaction so this is what that this is a combination because most of these medicines are either synergistic to each other so synergistic medicine has to be given on one day antagonistic medicine has to be 
given on the next day. Synergistic medicine are given on a particular day like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Antagonistic muscle, uh, medicine has to be given on next day like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday so that the reactions of one drug does, is not neutralized by the other drug. I think most of the my uh, learned uh, he, uh, most of the persons who have heard me speaking on this, they might have got a copy of this with them, and they can realize that what is combined with what, and that is the reason this combination is a highly successful recipe for most of the arthritic patient even if they are suffering from so-called osteoarthritis. In my definition, there is no separate chapter for osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Both are autoimmune inflammatory disorders of musculoskeletal system. One is aggressive, where it is seropositive. I tell that the patient has to take be on the medication for the rest of her life and which is zero negative they can be off the medicine after a while and again they will have to start the medication or they can continue their treatment on a low dose recipe this is a low dose recipe in which you see that the folitrex or the bethotrexate is only given twice a week and supplements are and the other medicine are also given accordingly. So a low dose medicine is what we can call as a top up doses after a three month period. I'm telling you that my patients are on these medications, whether they, they, they have come to me as a seropositive or an aggressive arthritic patient, but they are on this medication for years together, although for safety uh, purposes, I always say that they have to come and get their blood test every three months. See, this is the classical example of one of my patients who came for a, another side knee replacement. I said, well, if I can go for a smaller surgery on this side and keep you on this medication, you can avoid surgery like a knee replacement you had been through on the right side. So three years down the line, you see that proximal fibular osteotomy and my low dose DMARD is maintaining the disease activity at a very low level. Patient is very happy as she can, she can bend the left knee and it is absolutely pain free. She is more confident walking on her left knee. She puts the left knee forward to go to the stairs because she gets those proprioceptive feeling of pressing the knee or the steps of the knee of the, of the stairs. And she is more confident in stepping down as well by the left knee rather than the right knee, which is proprioceptively dull. There is no feedback to the brain about the proprioception which we feel in a normal joint. My regime in osteoarthritis followed by physiotherapy exercises and diet preparations, preference and restriction. I don't look at the x-ray for the joint degeneration only do PFO or proximal fibular osteotomy, high tibial osteotomy after a few months of regime to correct the alignment of the limb. See it for yourself, the dramatic relief in not only the joint pain, but also the general well-being and improved effort tolerance of a debilitated patient. Future management, medication for a lifelong with adequate supplements, intermittent blood tests are to be done, 
वंस ए ईयर अल्ट्रासाउंड होल एबडोम बी एम डी डेक्सा टू चेक दैट द पेशेंट इज नॉट लूजिंग कैल्शियम और बोन डेंसिटी रेगुलर एक्सरसाइज एनकरेजिंग वॉक्स टू टू थ्री मंथली विजिट्स टू द डॉक्टर फॉर ब्लड प्रेशर वेट मॉनिटरिंग सेल्फ मोटिवेशन by talking to other patients who are recovering this has been my sheet anchor of treatment for the patients i practice so office orthopedics contains those therapy or those management which can deliver whatever you promise to the patient for a long time without taking any risk about the patient arthritis is a disease which is not sitting in the joints pain may be in the joint but arthritis is a generalized disease and reversing arthritis means the patient general well being is also considered see this patient came with a badly deformed hand one year of therapy the patient does not want any surgery see the butonial deformities but the flexibility and the painless mobility of the hand this is the way this is only one year and when they continue with the treatment they this woman was able to make dow he she can uh, she could make chapatis she could cook she could stand from a wheelchair bound state to a active member of the society of the family who is contributing to the to only not even to her own health but to the hygiene of the entire family of the diet of the entire family this is a highly prevalent condition in a, any society and many of our friends neighbors family members are suffering from it so ill information myth ambiguous treatment is being sold by commercially motivated pharma companies otc ointment lotion balm sell the tune 200 300 crores annually involving cinema actors players and doctors to promote the sale in their advertisements so this is what is mobilizing the pharma companies to make more and more otc products in the form of ointment lotions and balms see this is an osteoarthritis patient this is 25 2019 and this is 511 2021 in two years see the recovery of joint space it is never taught in our test books that a joint space will ever recover and i am showing it to all of you with proof to see that this is the condition in which the joint came to me and this is the condition in which my regime got back this patient i have not done any surgery you see the fibrocartilage developed and the joint fully moving i have in my list patients who are been on my medication for the last 20 years 25 years the maximum is 32 years and they have never complained god forbid of any complication due to medicine so the primary thing which i want to convince my listeners is the medicine is safe but we can't keep our safety profiles to go to sleep we have to whenever the patient comes i always insist on basic blood test cbc esr crp sgpt creatinine that's it if these parameters are all right once a year ultrasound is all right once a year bone density is all right in women of course then my therapy is going well patient is happy patient is thankful only i am at loss of monetary funds 
फ्रॉम द पेशेंट दैट इज ट्रू बट माई पेशेंट आर वेरी थैंकफुल टू मी दैट आपने मेरा ऑपरेशन बचा लिया एवरीबडी विल सजेस्ट दिस लेडी टू गो थ्रू ए टोटल नी रिप्लेसमेंट विच आई हैव डिलीवर्ड इन दिस स्टेज what we need is a safe regime which can we used in our day to day patients with minimal diagnostic supervision and no pain killers no pain killers i never give my patients a single tablet of even crocin see this is another patient in which you see there is a recovery in the bone density the bone density here in 2000 19 15 december is 0.837 in the spine and here in 2021 it is 899 that means after 2 years although the patient has aged is more uh, by 2 years age but the bone density has improved because of my regime not because of my regime because i have been able to reverse the disease which was causing the osteoporosis not her old age she is 75 year old but at age of 73 she has started reversing to a better bone density at the age of 75 this is a proof this i call as dr mukherjee's sign see this lady has got erosion in both the si joints and the and the bone adjacent to the si joint is a woman is highly vulnerable to the si joint secretions which collect at that area is a, because i sacroiliac joint is a synovial joint in a woman they are the size of a palm and both the joints secrete in in inflammatory condition they secrete inflammatory uh, synovial fluid which erodes the bone and the area which i have marked indicates that it has eaten up the iliac bones on both the sides this is a highly classical sign which my students and my followers say as dr mukherjee's sign if i see this sign in my patients who is complaining of back ache or knee pain especially women women because sino si joint is secretory in women but uh, facet joint is secretory in men so is his a sign which is mukherjee's sign which says don't do any investigations she is a declared case of spondyloarthritis and start your regime i don't subject this patient to any money letting investigations see this is what i see in a everyday practice i see about 30 to 40 patients every day and this i see in my patients who have been suffering from arthritis and i don't subject these patients to any blood test any serological tests any expensive bone scans or any mri and blah blah just see this and start my regime and you will uh, reap the rich dividends see this if this is spine is a degenerative this is not a degenerative spine the disc have burrowed inside the vertebral bodies the end plate has eroded the disc has gone there why because the inflammation causes the disc to soften and this is the disc which is vulnerable to prolapse this is the disc which presses the which goes inside the spinal canal and presses the spinal root but why does this disc happen like this because this is the site of inflammation so if we, if i see an mri i can see various levels of water retention uh, inflammation in this spine and this is a site of chronic inflammatory spinal arthritis 
or we can say spondyloarthritis. My patient will respond to this, my demands, and will be very grateful to me for the rest of her life. Because everybody will try to convince this lady to get this disc out or that disc out, but that is not the end of the story. So they always say that they continue the medication and you will never go to a knife happy surgeon. See, this, are, this is a classical picture, again, in which there are osteochondral fractures. And these osteochondral fractures, I was listening to a talk to, of uh, uh, Sanjeev Bhandari or probably Chaudhary, who was telling, they inject outside the joint. But these are the painful joints. This, this is a painful joint where their attachment of the medial and lateral collateral ligament you see at the femoral uh, lateral collateral ligament, there is an erosion of the bone because that is the inflammatory site for the lateral collateral ligament attachment. And that also erodes the bone indicating that this is an active inflammation going on in this joint. Thrombosis of the blood vessel, which is a hallmark of osteoarthritis, causes osteochondral fractures. And these osteochondral fractures, they float in the, in the joint, in a bigger joint, as loose bodies, and they get entangled now and then, causing more and more damage and inflammation, which we should see that they are suffering from arthritis and the thrombosis of the subchondral vessel leads to osteochondral fracture. So fixing this osteochondral fracture with the help of a pin and this and this blah is not worth taking the effort. See the associated problem of arthritis. You see that the rheumatoid nodules are there. Whenever you see a rheumatoid nodule, I don't even go for a serological test. She is R, uh, rheumatoid positive. A, 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 a RA positive, a zero positive patient, a rheumatoid patient, a patient with nodules is always, always zero positive. So if I see nodule, I palpate these are the sites which are very commonly seen. It can be seen in the sole of the feet also. It can be seen in the extensor aspect of the forearm. And the patient will herself tell that these are the nodules which are painful. And when you give my regime to these patients, the size of the nodule and the tenderness also diminishes. These are the focus areas of inflammation surrounded by round cell infiltration as well as few giant cells, which are very, very classical of rheumatoid arthritis. So I, as a hand surgeon, when you send your, uh, suppose you have operated a decurvance disease, you send a piece of synovial tissue to the pathologist friend, they will say that this is also rheumatoid. When you send a piece of A1 uh, pulley, which has been causing trigger, triggering to the finger, then they say, again, it is a round cell infiltration and a rheumatoid. We, they say, not that the specific language is non-specific, autoimmune, inflammatory, round cell infiltration. So these are all autoimmune disorders and injecting an autoimmune focal area with steroid reverses the problem for a time being. If you have got multiple areas, then uh, we, we can't keep on repeating. That is a systemic problem. One has to give my regime, which is safe, and I can promise that this has been, this is being used by the feedback of thousands and thousands of patients in a way that it has come today in this form. These patients, especially women, has give, have given me suggestion how to make a particular recipe as a woman uh, are very particular about cooking their meals and they have their 
in story about their particular recipe. So this my regime is a feedback from those thousands of women to whom I am very thankful because their feedback has given the prescription in this form that it is safe today. I can advise my friends and colleagues all over the world to use it and see the results themselves. I am not selling you anything worth even a rupee from my pocket that you buy this or you buy that. It is a, it is a system in which you can learn these things and deliver the deliver well-being to, to your countless patients. Because orthopedic OPD consists of only rheumatoid patients or related patients except trauma, congenital anomalies, and infection. Except these three, every other patient in our orthopedic OPD is a rheumatoid patient or an associate rheumatoid patient. If you consider these and treat these patients according to what I have been doing, office orthopedics will not give you any time to go and operate even. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have got any questions, I'm ready to answer. Dr. Ashok, are you there? Hello. Hello. Yes, sir, I'm there. Uh, my my uh, laptop got discharged. So again, I, I reconnected. Sorry, sir. Sir, uh, one, 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 one question. Uh, a normal orthopedic surgeon like me, we always uh, are at fear to start and DMI RDs uh, to the patient. That is the fear which I want to alleviate from your mind. Yes. Sir. That is the fear which was in my mind also when I was in your age. Over the period of 35 years, this prescription got modified into a form where there is no fear. where there is no fear. This is in use in many junior colleagues and friends all over India. And their OPD footfall has increased many folds. Because why does the patient come to me for pain? And if I can deliver a pain-free life, pain-free mobility, who is going to subject his limb for a surgery? It is the pain which motivates the patient for a surgical intervention. If there is no pain, they may be walking with a lurch, but there is no pain, they will not come to you for a surgery. Definitely. So what I have been embarking on, I have been emphasizing on that my all the young colleagues, they should use DMARDs in their butt. The way, the, when you start DMARD, get the primary basic blood test. CBC, ESR, CRP, SGPT, creatinine, sugar. And within a month, you get a ultrasound also of the whole abdomen. Because most of these patients have a fatty liver. Many patients have kidney stones. And many patients have IBS. So that should be known in their mind that I, when I came to see the doctor, 
I already was suffering from this was the picture. That's it. So that they cannot, an illiterate orthopedic surgeon may blame you, may blame you that your medicine has caused this. So what you need is a, these are the things which can be done in any city. A plain X-ray, we, which we already get done, X-ray of the pelvis, especially if a woman patient is there, see <laughs> Dr. Mukherjee's sign there and find out on your own whether the patient needs Dr. Mukherjee's regime or not. Give me only two patients per week and give me the feedback. Sir, actually we have already started the famous Mukherjee regime for four patients of avian hip. Uh, since we since we met at IOACON Goa, yes. that time I, I took that regime from you and we started and they are happy, sir. Pain has already gone. Why it is good? Because the regime is safe in years of use. It is only not only three or four months. The regime is safe in my patients who are taking this for years together. And they are still queuing up in my clinic for the next dose. Only thing that subsequent dose, I according to the ESR and CRP level, I will have to reduce the dose to a level where there is only a top-up dose so that the disease is under remission. Why does the avian reverse? Avian reverses because the thrombosis reverses. Yes. If I give my regime to a patient who has got dark colored black feet or leg in, in chronic uh, uh, arthritic uh, arthritis or in chronic uh, hypertensive patient, they start reversing and the, uh, the skin becomes healthy and normal. The nail starts growing in the toe. The ingrowing toenails get cured, gets cured. It is because of the poor perfusion in the lower limb that the ingrowing toenail is happening. Because the nail is not growing, that nail is getting hard. You understand? You see the nail of an old man, how hard it is. It is because of the poor perfusion and atherosclerosis and lupus in the lower limb. Discolored skin, once I start giving my treatment, within six months, within one year, I see that the skin has become normal, the nails have started growing, pairing is easy, the ingrowing toenail is better. Because of the lower limb, because we are in an erect position on, on our both the feet, that the blood is getting static in the lower limb. And that causes dependent edema. The most common cause of edema in the leg is not heart attack or uh, uh, not uh, cardiogenic or nephrogenic. It is because of arthritis. Most common cause of pedal edema is arthritis. Later on with age, it becomes cardiac or uh, or due to, due, to, due to CKD or chronic kidney disease like that. But to our side, we should always touch our patient's feet. If the temperature of the feet is low, less, then it is the circulation problem. And this regime will improve the circulation in the lower limb. So you try it yourself. It is not a question that this is my theory or my regime. You can say it is Ashok's regime. It is not a Arup Mukherjee. We, we have already started. So you had, in your experience, you had prescribed so many patients. Any adverse effects you, you had come Not at with? all. Because see, this is when I am serving you. After I have taken this regime in about 6 lakh prescriptions. Then I am telling it to Ashok. Then I am telling it to other people that why can't you try this? 
There is no monetary transaction between me and telling others. I am not selling any implant. I am not selling any technique of surgery. It is simply because we, as a surgeon, our our thinking is always doing something surgical. Our avian is a medical problem. Now you run after the patient with a drill. कि तुम उसमें वो करा लो. एक एक करा. हाँ. फिर कुछ के अंदर हाँ उसके अंदर कोई stem cell डाल रहा है. तो it is our bent of mind. एक बच्चे को तुम hammer दे दो. He will try to fix everything in the house with that hammer. तो वो surgeon का वही हालत है. He has got a knife in his hand. He is trying to fix everything with his knife. नी खराब हो गया है तो चलो नीट बदल दो हिप खराब हो गया है तो चलो हिप बदल दो सो दिस इज अ रॉन्ग डिजीज इन 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 ए रॉन्ग फैकल्टी और वी हैव टू चेंज अवर माइंड सेट दैट दिस इज अ मेडिकल प्रॉब्लम एंड मल्टीपल टाइम्स आई हैव शोन माय फॉलो अप रिजल्ट्स ऑफ रिवर्सल ऑफ एवियन टुडे आल्सो आई शोड माई आर्थरेटिक नी With zero joint space, with some joint space, and the patient is happy two years down the line. Today also I showed a woman who has gone from seventy three to seventy five and has improved inner bone density in BMD DEXA. That is what the pharmaceutical companies are chasing me. Why can't you take a lecture? in in osteoporosis and promote promote periparatide the credit goes to the set of medication which suppresses the inflammation yes which suppresses the crp which suppresses the esr which reduces the tension of the system because of this stress the steroid secretion of an arthritic patient is many times higher than a normal patient and a normal person ko itna stress hota hi nahi hai because the stress is maximum maximum stress is caused by the inflammatory cytokines in the body and the liver responds primarily as a fatty changes because of this elevated crp and esr the liver thinks that there is an impending danger to the body it starts collecting fat as a energy resource energy source and when this fat spills in the blood then you get dyslipidemia why there is a high all the arthritis patient you take my words most of the patient with the knee pain you will find they have got a fatty liver kara ke dekh lo if you are doing an opd aap patient se kaho ki tum ultrasound karao gall stones may be a coincidental finding but fatty liver will be a universal finding why because liver goes into a state of emergency by collecting and shows the urgency to collect the fat by even converting food into fat so that is what the message is so please uh, uh, in case you find any problem you can uh, call me and uh, uh, talk to me let let us discuss yes sir i had called you couple of times in the past yes sir let us discuss and sort out your problem yes. i'll be most happy thank you for a patient listening thank you sir thank you thank you all sir so <clears throat> this uh, <clears throat> west zone uh, indian orthopedic association cme uh, the topic is office orthopedics uh, we, we continued it and uh, uh, in between there was some power issues and some like my laptop got discharged uh, but then again i joined so 
we will have this same session that is part 4 on next sunday same time okay. so i thank all of you i thank uh, ortho tv for uh, for allowing us uh, and uh, <coughs> projecting this program and uh, thank you arup sir uh, thank you well, well. Ilani, uh, Dr. Vijlani, and uh, see you, see you next Sunday, same time. Thank you okay. very much. Bye bye.